Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me for another restful episode of True Scary Stories to Help You Fall Asleep. Today, we are going to be reading True Creepy Backwoods Stories. This is another one of the videos that was remastered from several videos that I had to private due to YouTube regulations. I have, once again, taken away all of the things in this video that YouTube may raise their eyebrows at. I hope you do enjoy this video. So, for now, without further ado, lay back, relax, and enjoy these true scary stories. I went to a summer camp in a rural part of New Jersey back in the mid-1990s. The camp was situated on a long, narrow, man-made lake. One end of the lake was reserved for swimming, which we'd do as a group activity every other day or so. The swimming area had one long dock stretching straight out into the water, and two square floating docks further out. One of the two floating docks was a bit far away, and although I've spent a few summers at this camp at the time of this incident, I had never seen anyone use the second dock. One day, our group of about a dozen 11-year-olds got the bright idea that we were going to swim out to the faraway dock. I would consider this to be a moderate challenge for a casual swimmer. When we reached the dock, I noticed a strange-looking spider on the ladder that you had to use to climb up. It was quite large in terms of overall footprint, probably about two inches from end to end, with long, skinny legs. Spiders, of course, are normal critters to encounter in nature, but this one stood out to me because of its unusual appearance. After the long swim, we took a few minutes to lie on the dock and rest in the sun. It was relaxing, and we were all having a good time. We started messing around and decided to play one of our regular games where we would all shuffle towards the corner of the dock, causing it to sink. As the corner of the dock started to sink and fill with water, suddenly, hundreds of giant spiders came frantically pouring out from between the boards, swarming over and around the feet of those of us who were still standing on dry ground. The dock was theirs, apparently. We all immediately began to scream and jump into the water, trying to get away. But the spiders were in the water, too and stuck to us as we swam. I vividly remember the feeling of them clinging to my wet hair, fleshy bodies and long squirming legs hopelessly intertwined with my own strands. Adrenaline propelled us back to the main part of the swimming area, and by the time we got there, thankfully we were spider free. But this is a childhood trauma that lingers with me, and I had not really been afraid of spiders before, but I would say this was a major turning point. The thought of us lying on the dock in the sun completely oblivious to the horde that was lurking just inches beneath us creeps me out to this very day. This is a story that my mother and aunts told me when I was in high school. I'm 21 now and it has never left me. I think about it constantly and ponder over what happened. My grandfather passed away close to a year ago in June of 2020. He was 96 when he died, and it caused some issues with my family. They don't really pertain to the story, but there are some things about him that I have to share in order to explain the story in the best way. My grandfather, John, was a man who was extremely callous and old-fashioned. He was bitter, abusive, and a complete macho man. My mother was raised on never showing emotion or pain due to his abuse and lack of compassion for others. He was also an extreme racist. He had many secrets in my family that are now coming to light after his death. Everything that happened around him was brushed off and forgotten because he had more important things to do, like drinking and having affairs. Just an overall intense and very no-nonsense type of man. He also was not religious at all and had found things like faith and hope stupid. This story takes place sometime in the 70s, most likely early to mid-70s. My mom was born in 1965 and remembers this story clearly. My aunts as well remember this happening, but no one knows exactly what year. One summer day, John decided to take his family on a small outing with the intent to have a picnic in the woods. 
my mother, her three sisters, and her mother slash my grandmother were all there and very excited about this. Where we are from, my family is more than accustomed to the woods and has lived in this area for generations. Going into the woods for a fun family activity was nothing out of the ordinary and seemed to be just another normal day. They made their way down a dirt backwoods road and stopped once they had found a clearing large enough to accommodate them. As all the kids started jumping out of the car and messing around as kids do after being stuck together, my grandmother began unloading their food and picnic supplies. John began surveying the area and decided where to set up. As he was doing that, something in the woods past the clearing caught his eye. Before going to see what was out there, he yelled at the family and said that he would be right back. The kids and my grandmother thought not much of this, since they're all used to the woods, and these woods in particular were very familiar to them. They continued unloading and setting up the stuff that they brought. One of the girls pointed out something in the clearing that caused a sudden shift from a normal day to something far worse. It was a dirt mound that looked like something was buried under it. This mound was about the size of a small person, maybe even child size. It was too big to simply be any animal in these woods. There was nothing but squirrels and raccoons in the area. Scattered amongst the mound were larger river rocks. There was no pattern, but they were definitely placed on the mound intentionally. Also, the dirt seemed to be fresh, as though it was just buried. It was loose and slightly darker than the area around it. The mood immediately shifted from an average day in the woods to something much darker. My grandmother became concerned and told the girls to stay away from it. She was clearly upset and worried about it, but did her best to ignore it. The girls, all being children, didn't have the same amount of worry and continued playing while just avoiding the mound. They tried to return to their picnic, and the girls were already chasing each other in circles again. It was supposed to be a joyous, sunny day, and my grandmother wanted to keep it that way. Things seemed to return to normal for a beat. The trees around them created a wall of dense foliage, blocking their view from anything inside the forest. One of the girls again took notice of something strange. It was clear immediately what it was. Along one of the long branches of the tree hung a noose. It was tied with rope and hung high above their heads. A lump of dirt can be explained away by nature, but someone had to have placed the noose there. My grandmother stopped dead in her tracks when she first saw it. Something was wrong. Very, very wrong. They couldn't just pack up and leave. John was still out in the woods. Even children can recognize a noose as a symbol of death. The children started to become very anxious. Whatever innocence was keeping them from worrying about the mound had completely vanished. My grandmother, the resilient woman she is, soothed her children and told them it was just left there by deer hunters. But she knew in her heart that they needed to leave. No deer hunter would hang a deer and then bury it. At least no sane deer hunter. It wasn't until they started hearing something in the woods that they began to really panic. My grandmother, as well as all the children, began hearing a rhythmic chanting from deep in the woods. It sounded as though there was a group of people, all singing in deep voices to the beat of a drum. It went in a quick bum-bum-bum pattern. Three steady beats, followed by a pause. Then it would repeat. It sounded far away, but immediately fear began to take hold on each of them. They each listened and gathered together. As the seconds passed... It began to increase in volume. It was getting not just louder, but closer. What started out as a distant echo soon began to engulf the entire clearing. My grandmother was terrified and wanted so desperately to leave, but John had yet to return. They waited, fear-ridden, as the sound began to fill their chests. It felt like they were at a concert as the deep bass began to vibrate in their chest. It was everywhere and constant, as though the sound was being made by the trees themselves, surrounding the family in every direction. Suddenly, the sound of yelling broke through the constant drone of chanting. John's voice was yelling out to them from the trees. Go, he yelled. Get in the car. He came running out of the woods, yelling that they needed to leave. They had never seen terror on this man as they had in this very moment. He was a man afraid of nothing unbothered by the world around him. This was the most emotion any of them had ever seen from him. He saw something in those woods, something that shook his very being to his core. 
My grandmother began throwing everything back in the car as the kids got in as well. John and my grandmother picked up their things and as quickly as possible threw it all into the car. They had no care for the things they were packing up due to their fear. Food was all over the trunk and items were broken. After everything was tossed in, they both got in the car and drove away. This is where the main grunt of the story ends. But one fact from this story is what really has caused me to wonder all of these years. My grandfather has refused to ever speak of what he saw. He never told any of the children or my grandmother. Every time this was brought up, he quickly rebuffed it and angrily told them not to ask again. He never went to the police or told anyone outside of the family. My grandfather is the only person who knows what happened that day. When I first heard the story, I swore to myself that I would ask him one day. Now I can't, and I regret it greatly. By the time I was in high school, he had moved out of the state with other family members, and I mostly lost contact with him, outside of occasional happy birthday calls or letters. This story doesn't have an answer to go with it. When he died, the only thing I was sad about was never knowing what happened that day. We weren't close when I got older, and once I learned of all the abuse he caused, I separated myself from him. His death looms over me, and this story still haunts me to this day. My mother and aunts just look back on it as a spooky memory from their childhood. Nothing more than a story to spook the little ones at Thanksgiving. I am one of the only people in the family who is still curious about what happened. I've always been interested in mysteries, the occult, horror, and conspiracy theories. This story piqued my interest more than any of the others in my family. Which, by the way... This isn't the only strange story for my family, but it definitely is the most strange. I wish I had answers. I hope you all find this story as fascinating as I do. I will gladly answer any questions, and I would love to hear theories about what was in those woods that day. Thank you for reading. Back around 2004 or 2005, I was leaving a buddy's house headed home. He lived on Lake Ariel in Wayne County. I was a good 15 miles away, so I decided to take back roads to save time and avoid cops. As I crest this mountain road, I see a van off the side, doors open, lights on. It's well after midnight, and no one is on the road. I slowed my car, a 1989 Volkswagen ragtop, down to first gear looking for a person or people that may be hurt. Not a soul is around, and the woods are quiet. The van off the road is not running, but all lights are on, and the driver's door is open. I remember thinking, I don't have cell service until the top of the mountain. I gotta call the cops. So I proceeded to go forwards, where I knew that I had cell service. Maybe going 30 mile per hour tops. I knew this situation was messed up, but then it got worse. No more than three or so miles away, the brush thinned on the roadside, so you had a better view of what's in the woods. I see movement, so I let off the gas, thinking that I didn't want to hit a deer. As I let off, this man, soaking in fresh blood, comes from the tree line and into the road. He's so covered in gore, I couldn't tell that it was a man at first. He stumbled out in front of the car and waved me down. I was in my rag top, top down of course. He was yelling and grabbing at my door. I dropped into the first and took off. Another mile or so, I had cell service and called the cops. Dude was obviously hurt, and his grab for my door scared me. There is a wide space on the mountain where I agreed to wait for the cops. They were there in under 10 minutes. While I waited, I put the top up and locked the doors. An officer took my statement and he looked over my car with a torch. The guy from the woods left a bloody smear down my door. Another officer found the van but couldn't locate the guy who came out of the woods. The cops let me go home and said they'd call if they needed anything further. Within a few days, I did get a call saying the van was located and they asked if I could describe the man. They never found him that night and as far as I know, they never did later either. Apparently the van was stolen and the cops surmised this guy banged himself up and took off in a panic. As far as I know, they never did track him down. To this day, I keep a lookout for a bloody man running out of the woods. This experience has stuck with me, 
and is 100% true. This is a real experience that happened to me when I was around 10, camping with my family at a provincial park in Newfoundland, Canada in the mid-1980s. In Newfoundland, there is a lot of traditional folklore about fairies and being fairy-led, i.e. being sort of mesmerized and stolen away by the fairies. And although I've never really believed in that stuff, whenever I hear those tales, I can't help but think about this experience. We arrived at the campground around mid-afternoon. I remember that it was strangely empty. We saw no other occupied sites as we drove around, looking for the perfect spot. We picked our site, and as my parents were setting up, my older sister asked if she and I could go check out the little beach area, which was a shortish walk along a clearly marked downhill path through some birch woods. Our mom said yes, but told us to be back in two hours. We found the sign pointing us to the beach trail and headed down the path. Almost as soon as we were out of sight of the campground, things started to feel off. It was weirdly quiet, with a sort of muffled feeling. No birds calling, no breeze, just a thick, velvety silence. I also noticed that there were strange-looking ferns growing thickly along the path all around us. Ferns are not an unusual sight in the Newfoundland woods, but these were different from the ones that I'd seen before. They were bright, almost luminous green, and very, very large. Some were as tall as I was. I couldn't shake the feeling that there were people or animals hiding in them watching us pass by. Although it had been a lovely clear day, the weather started to change as we walked. A low-lying fog rolled in as we descended, first in tendrils close to the ground, then gradually rising around us as we went lower towards the water. Even living in Newfoundland, I'd never walked into a fog like that before, and it did nothing to relieve that eerie feeling that I was trying to ignore. Finally, we arrived at a steep set of wooden stairs, and following them we emerged onto a small, foggy beach. With the woods behind and above us, it felt very closed in, and I started wishing that we were safely back with our parents at our campsite. My sister made a small noise behind me, and I turned to see what had caught her attention. Although I'd thought we were alone, I now noticed that there was a man several meters away, standing very still and gazing silently out over the water. My sister called out a friendly hello. It was Newfoundland in the 80s. People did that sort of thing. But he didn't move or appear to hear her at all. After a minute or two, I started to feel nervous. So I talked my sister into heading back to our campsite. This is where things get a bit fuzzy. I don't remember leaving the beach. But the next thing I knew, we were on a wide, unfamiliar dirt road. It seemed like no time had passed. But I was tired and my legs and feet felt like I had been walking for a long time. The sun was also pretty low in the sky, which was strange because I thought we'd been gone for less than an hour. I felt disoriented and had no idea where we were, and I started to panic a bit, thinking that we were lost. My sister immediately went into protective older sibling mode, saying not to worry because she was pretty sure she knew the way back. We headed off down the road in the direction she suggested, and walked for about 45 minutes or so until we finally emerged at the campground not far from our campsite. It was now almost completely dark, and we ran into our trailer to find our dad was worriedly asking where we had been. Although we thought we had been gone for less than two hours, my dad said that we'd been gone for more than five. He said that our mom had headed back to the beach to look for us while he'd stayed back to wait for us at the campsite. By now, full-on darkness was setting in, and our dad was worried that our mom had not returned with us. As he prepared to go out looking for her, she burst in the door frantically saying that she'd run up and down the hill and trail multiple times and hadn't found us. She was amazed when she saw us. The only way to access that beach, aside from cutting through steep, thick woods, was to take that trail, and we had not passed her. Once we'd all calmed down, we ate dinner and headed to bed. As I lay in my bunk, I remember hearing my mom quietly tell my dad how creepy and strange the trail had felt. Although we'd planned to stay longer, we packed up and left quickly the following morning and never return to that campground.
Growing up, I was fortunate enough to live right at the edge of a very large nature preserve. The area was not open to the public, but thanks to the location of my neighborhood, there were several lesser known entrances that I could use to gain access and explore to my heart's content. Countless days of my childhood were spent hiking, swimming, and playing pretend with my best friend in the woods. The woods became like a second home to me. I felt like I knew every shortcut and secret cave, and I always felt at peace except for one exceptional instance that is the subject of this post. My best friend and neighbor, who I'll refer to as Jacob, knew these woods just as well as I did. We had several choice spots that we liked hiking to, and a couple of makeshift forts that we made out of sticks and such. Keep in mind that things were simpler back then, and our parents felt little need to worry about us, and were accustomed to us disappearing for hours on end while we explored these woods. This was also before cell phones were a thing. One more important thing to note is that these woods were once home to Native Americans, more specifically the Comanche tribe. Oftentimes, we would find arrowheads left by the natives, or ancient cans and bits of supplies presumably left by the settlers, who eventually found the area for themselves. We found this bit of history fascinating, and going in the woods sometimes felt like taking a step away from the modern world and going back to a different time. One afternoon, Jacob and I packed up some water and snacks and set out into the woods like we had many times before. Usually, we would stick to the trails or the creek, so that we would be able to find our way back home easily. But today, we had an urge to explore even deeper than we had ever gone before. We headed off the trail and into the uncharted areas of the preserve that even our parents hadn't taken us to before. Things were fine at first, but soon we realized that the trees had gotten incredibly dense. It became increasingly difficult to walk as dead tree branches seemed to reach and claw at us every step of the way. We both found ourselves a sturdy stick and used this as a machete, chopping and carving ourselves a path through the trees. There were no longer any trails to be found, but we didn't care. We were invincible kids who knew these woods well. What's the worst that could happen? We had been proceeding like this for probably about 15 or 20 minutes when we got a horrible feeling. That horrible feeling that we're being watched. Jacob and I looked at each other with practically the same exact moment. And he said, dude, do you feel that? Yeah, I said, I feel it. We both agreed that something felt very wrong. We couldn't describe why, but we both had the same feeling of dread that someone or something was watching us. We quickly agreed that it was time to head back. We turned around and started to make our way back. But after several minutes, we started having doubts that we knew where we were. The woods were dense here denser than any other part of the preserve that we had seen, and it was nearly impossible to move. We were getting tired from hacking away tree branches and decided to stop for a break and try to get our bearings. That's when we noticed something else that was wrong. It was completely silent, save for our labored breathing. These woods, normally teeming with life, were absolutely still. I still haven't experienced anything like that to this day. We couldn't hear a single bug or bird or the rushing water of the creek it was suddenly dead there. These comfortable woods that we were so familiar with suddenly felt alien and hostile, and we still had that feeling of being watched, although stalked might be a better word for it. Jacob and I were absolutely done with the adventure by this point. We were completely turned around and we couldn't even tell if we were heading back the way we came. We tried to climb a tree to see where we were, but it was too difficult. We would have had to break dozens of branches just to get a couple feet off the ground, and these trees were tall. The branches were so thick that they blocked out the sun at times. When climbing the tree failed, we both started yelling in hopes that someone might hear us. But the only reply we got was the oppressive silence of the woods. It was at this moment of desperation that we spotted something through the trees, Probably about 20 or so yards away, out of the corner of our eyes, we clearly saw an adult-sized figure, which quickly moved behind a tree once we spotted it. Jacob and I traded one brief and panicked look at each other, and bolted in the opposite direction of the figure. We sprinted like human wrecking balls through the branches, no longer taking the care to carve ourselves a nice safe path. Branches clawed and scraped at our arms and legs and faces 
as our flight instinct kicked into overdrive. My lungs burned, but I did not care. At one point, Jacob, who was wearing our backpack full of water and snacks, got snagged on a particularly big branch. I stopped to help untangle him as fast as I could, and we kept sprinting, not daring to look back behind us. A few times I might have heard something breaking branches as it followed us, but I can't be certain. We continued running for what felt like ages. In reality, we ran for what was probably 15 or 20 minutes. When we finally broke through the tree line and into a clearing, I was so relieved that I could have cried. I wished that the story ended here, so that I could chalk it up to an overactive imagination of two stupid lost kids. But I can't. Because it turns out, this clearing was essentially the backyard of a very large and very old two-story house. A house that we didn't know existed until now. Decades-old blue paint peeled off the exterior. The roof was missing several shingles, many of which were lying on the overgrown grass below. The house had several large windows that were caked with grime. A single dirt road made its way from the front of the house and up a small hill where we couldn't see where it led to. It was obvious that this house wasn't part of our neighborhood, or any neighborhood that we had ever been to before for that matter. Jacob and I were halfway terrified and halfway in awe at our discovery. This house felt like our own personal discovery after a perilous quest. A bit of our fear from the woods evaporated as we summoned the courage to investigate this house. We walked up to the side of the house that was on our left and peered through the dirty window and into the strange house. The first floor seemed to consist of mainly one large room. Along the wall opposite us was a wooden staircase leading to the second floor. The first floor was completely devoid of any furniture. No tables or chairs or couches or anything. Just dozens upon dozens of broken bottles. Shards of glass covered almost the entirety of the first floor, as well as a few yellowed books and magazines that were sprawled open, some with pages clearly ripped out and laying next to them. And in the center of the room was a single sleeping bag, filthy from what we could see, with an unlit candlestick sitting next to it. What are y'all doing? We immediately pulled away from the window and saw that a man had walked around from the right side of the building and was now standing about 15 feet away from us. He was wearing nothing except for some dirty denim overalls. He had scarred skin that looked like rough leather. And his eyes? Neither of his eyes were looking in the same direction, and neither one was looking directly at either of us. Everything about this man looked wrong. You know how some people can just feel their energy? It's hard to describe, but this guy just felt so wrong in every way. We were frozen in place, surprised and terrified by his appearance. We stared at him for a moment until Jacob found the words to speak. We're uh, just checking out the house, he said sheepishly. The stranger seemed to take a moment to digest his response before gesturing to the woods and saying, You should head back the way you came. You never know. And he just let that last sentence hang in the air. You never know. Jacob, God bless him, quickly thought of something to say while I stared in absolute terror. Actually, we need to head to the road. Our parents will be expecting us soon. The man did not reply. He just stood there with his mouth slightly open, his eyes dancing off in different directions. It seemed like he was thinking hard about something to say. We didn't waste another second getting out of there. We walked as quickly as we could towards the front of the house and made our way up the dirt driveway, trying not to appear panicked. I say driveway because there were no cars at the house, not even a garage. The front of the house consisted of a porch, which was also littered with old cans, broken bottles, and yellowed pages from old magazines. We felt the man's eyes boring into our backs as we trudged up the driveway. It was rather long, and once we rounded the first corner and were out of sight of the house, we started running again. Eventually, we reached a pavement road. There was no mailbox or address that we could see. We followed this pavement road for quite a while. It was like ages before we could begin to recognize where we were again. Turns out, we had gone through the entire nature preserve and were on the complete other side from where our neighborhood was. It took the rest of the afternoon to walk back home, but we made it safe and sound without incident. We didn't tell our parents what happened because we were afraid that they'd restrict our freedom and not let us go into the woods again. We didn't go into the woods again for a few weeks, and when we did go back, we rarely left the trails 
and we never went into that area again. To this day, Jacob is still convinced that something paranormal is going on out there. That we found ourselves in the midst of things both unfathomable and dangerous. We're both usually pretty realistic and grounded people, but I'm inclined to agree with him. I'm still not sure if the feelings of dread slash spookiness in the woods and the house slash man are related in any way. I doubt I'll ever know. And ever since that day, we referred to that strange and forbidden area of the woods as the Indian Maze. So I was a wildland firefighter back in the day in Arizona. I worked in a forest that was generally popular with a lot of recreation in the northern portion, but I worked on the southern portion of the forest that was really remote. It barely had any roads or campgrounds, so if you wanted to recreate there, you had to work for it. The fire crew I was on had two duty stations, one in a small town where the rest of the forest employees worked out of, and one was about two and a half hours away up a really windy, mountainous road. The remote duty station had an old Forest Service Ranger station and a newer double-wide trailer that was recently put in. When I worked at this place, it had no cell reception. When my crew and I weren't working, we were playing horseshoes and watching movies. They did eventually add a cell phone booster, which sadly made people play on their phones, but I digress. So for my creepy story, I want to keep it pretty simple, but my supervisor from that crew had experienced some weird things as well working up there. There was one night he told me he was cowboy camping, sleeping outside with no tent, and he kept getting a weird mucusy drop of liquid on his face. He kept looking around and even yelling and no one was around him. He told me he wasn't below any trees, so he was sure it wasn't tree sap. He never slept outside there ever again, which leads me to believe he was telling me the truth. Not for my story. I've had other interesting experiences at that remote duty station, but this one was scary. It was the night of July 4th, and we weren't on a fire, so the crew was playing horseshoes and having a good time. Everyone went to bed pretty early, because we were going to have a PT hike the next day. I had my own small room in the double-wide trailer, and my bed was situated next to a big window. I started dozing off, but felt awake still, and I hear one of my co-workers outside my window asking me to come outside. I was laying on my side facing the window, and I didn't look up but I felt their presence by the window. It felt as though someone tall was looming over me from outside. They kept beckoning me and I said no. Pretty quickly, their voice started changing to a deeper, raspier, angrier voice. They started cursing at me. I just froze. It was sort of a demonic voice. I lay frozen, not moving while they yelled at me. Eventually it stopped and I fell asleep. I woke up the next day and wanted to ask my coworker if he was standing outside my window, but I felt too weird. Perhaps this was a mild form of sleep paralysis, but still, a weird experience nonetheless. Last night, around 8.30 p.m., I went out to the edge of the woods on my property to set up a blind to shoot some nuisance coyotes that have been eating my chickens. I live in New Hampshire, at an area where people who live near these woods commonly refer to as a phenomenon known as bad nights. It's an eerie feeling where you don't want to be anywhere near a door or window when it gets dark, and you certainly don't want to be outside. Animal life seems to be affected as well since it's always eerily quiet on those nights. Thankfully, it was a good night, so I thought I would be fine. I set up with a long-range modified handgun, a mounted night vision scope with a thermal setting, and a high-end night vision handheld. Both pieces of equipment have a high four-figure price range. I set up facing the woods, and for most of the night saw nothing, coyote or otherwise. A little before 10.30, I was scanning the field just before the tree line with my thermal scope when I saw a red orb pop up. It was about four feet off the ground, not moving. 
the thermal was giving a reading of 90 degrees Fahrenheit, which made no sense considering it was around 40 degrees that night. Also, the scope is very high definition. I can see small birds at 50 yards away, and they show up perfectly bird-shaped. There is no reason anything should look round. It also had a strange low-quality staticky look to it, which made no sense considering it was well within my 50-yard marker at the tree line. When I went to switch to night vision mode, it disappeared. I never saw anything else like it for the rest of the night. Later on, around 11, my handheld night vision scope started malfunctioning. The brightness and exposure was fluctuating wildly for no reason, and it was randomly turning on and off. I chalked it up to the battery being dead or dying and stopped using it. But this afternoon, when I started to get my equipment ready again, it was working perfectly normally. It's the same temperature again today, around 40 degrees, so it's not temperature related. The final weird thing was that around midnight, right as I was packing up to head inside, after having no luck with my coyote problem as my gun jammed and the animals ran off, I heard a voice laughing. It sounded echoey, and due to being on a hill and there being lots of trees, I couldn't pinpoint where it was coming from. I thought it was my neighbor who lives on the other side of the field. Note, the house was not in the direction that I was firing towards, just so no one comes for me about gun safety. The house was 200 feet behind me to the left. This morning... The neighbor was talking with me about how my hunt went, and I joked with her that she would know considering she laughed after I missed my shot. She was confused, and I said that I heard laughing and assumed it was from her house. She said no one in the house was outside or even awake at that time of night. So what do y'all think? You think it was a forest ghost messing with my equipment and laughing at me, or just equipment malfunctions? I'm going out again tonight. And I'll try to record if anything like that happens again. My wife and I were on our honeymoon in the Shenandoah Valley National Park in Virginia in 2019. We were excited to get an early evening hike just as we had arrived in town. We were driving to a hike on Skyline Drive at around 6 p.m. in a thick mist with overcast skies. We passed a strange-looking, solitary man on the road a few hundred yards before the trailhead. I made a comment to my wife about how odd he looked. You know, unkempt, vacant-looking, etc. We hiked up one and a half miles up the mountain to the end of the trail where it terminated at the AT. My wife stopped to pee and we collected ourselves before we turned to head back down towards our vehicle. Out of the mist came the guy that we'd passed on the road earlier. He was low-key brandishing one of those common hatchet-slash-hammer multi-tools at his side. He wasn't just carrying it. It was somewhat raised. It gets creepier. He made a comment as we passed him about how he had found a set of teeth the last time he was up there. He made an awkward acknowledgement of what he'd said, nervous laugh, and then quickly started down towards our vehicle, looking back up to where we'd come to see if he'd turn to follow us. Once we were 100 feet away, we began running down the mountain. We'd stop every minute or so to listen slash observe what was going on. It was terrifying. We obviously made it back to our car, but we were shook. We would read a few weeks later about how someone had been arrested in connection with a killing near that area at the same time that we were in that area. I visited Yellowstone National Park last week and decided to take our boat out on the Yellowstone Lake yesterday. This was our last day and wanted to end our trip on a high note. While we were loading our boat down into the launch pad, there were fishermen from Wisconsin catching trout, cutting them up, and then throwing them back into the lake. This is a government job, a.k.a. an angler incentive program to manage the fisheries. One could tell how experienced these men were and knowledgeable about the lakes just by talking to them and watching them work in rhythm, as they probably had for several years. Basically, these guys know their stuff. So, a couple of the older, bigger guys were kind enough to help us get our boat in. We're new to using this boat. 
The guys tell us to be careful. The water has big swells and it's getting windy. In a side conversation, an angler tells my dad about the bodies still lost in a lake that were never recovered, including a couple park rangers. The anglers explain the water is too cold and within 20 minutes hypothermia sets in. So again, he cautions us and we head out anyway. We didn't make it far. Three to five foot swells pushed us back in. It was almost as if the angler was expecting our short return, and he helped us guide the boat back into the dock onto the boat trailer. He just smiled and said, I'm glad you're back. It's bad weather out there. I thought I had to give you the background so you could see why I'm so curious about these missing people, bodies in the lake, and park rangers' bodies, all believed to be at the bottom of Yellowstone Lake. However, I cannot find any information on these missing people and missing rangers. I asked other park employees and researched National Park website. Nothing. What are your thoughts? Anyone know about missing people and missing park rangers at Yellowstone Lake? This happened to my mom. A few months ago in rural Montana, my mom took her dog outside to potty in the middle of the night. She had a big yard and her dog would go off leash. While she waited for her dog, my mom said that she heard a strange whistling. She would have thought it was a human, except whatever it was didn't seem to need to breathe. The sounds were continuous. She described it as a combination of every dog whistle you could imagine all at once. She was convinced that some creature was attempting to lure away her dog into the wilderness. Luckily, the dog didn't seem to react to the sound and returned to her after doing its business. A few days prior, my mom and stepdad had been rock hounding near their home, and they saw what looked like two-footed dog tracks going across the road that had an eight-foot stride. She thinks that this might have been all the work of a dog man, the cryptid dog that walks up right on two feet. As a child, she had a Bigfoot encounter. She is terrified of and believes in the existence of cryptids because of this. When I came to visit her this summer, she would not let me take out the dog after dark, and she would not do it herself either. She very frantically and empathetically made me promise not to go out after sundown. There were several strange occurrences at her home over the summer that I saw for myself. She is still seeking out other stories and experiences like hers to shed light on what might have happened to her. And so far, she has been unable to find any stories like hers. If you or someone you know have experienced whistling like that, please share. If anyone would like to hear more, I'd be happy to share. Unfortunately, my stepdad passed away while I was there, and now I am moving her back east with me right now. We're about to go get breakfast at the hotel lobby. It may be a few days before I can share more, and I may be slow to respond. My boyfriend and I had been dating almost a month at this point back in 2020. It was late October, almost Halloween. I wanted to do some fun nighttime nature walking, and my aunt told me about this cool unknown grave off of Lake Erie in a nature park. We went there and got super lost, and neither of us had reception, but we had a lot of fun. We stayed on the trail, so we weren't lost lost, and we could get back to the parking lot, but just lost enough for it to be the creepy kind of fun that we were looking for. We finally found the grave, got some pictures slash videos, took a short break, and saw that the lake was less than 10 yards from us, but we were at the top of a cliff. So, we decided to follow the trails further out along the lake, until we found a trail spot that took us to a little secluded beach. It was about 9pm, but it was October, so it was already really dark out, and it was partly cloudy. But the slight amount of stars lit up the lake in a way that was beautiful, so we sat on a log and just looked out while chatting a bit. After about 15 minutes of just sitting, looking, and relaxing, we both see this flash of light that came from behind us. I should tell you that unlike most stories like this, there was no alcohol or drugs involved. But we both see this flash and instantly freeze, look at each other, and ask if we both saw it. We turned on our flashlights and turned around to see where it came from. It looked like a really bright camera flash, 
but there was no one there. And we hadn't seen or heard anyone else out there the entire time that we were there. And it had been about two hours. We even checked around for trail cams in the area and we couldn't find anything. So we both grabbed large sticks from the beach and started walking down the trail to try and get back to the car. We didn't take the same trail back, which was kind of lucky judgment on our parts because the one we took was way faster than the one we took to get there. But the whole way back, we kept seeing eyes in the woods around us. They were just deer and coyotes and other animals inhabiting that area, and we knew that. But it still freaked us out and kept us on our toes. We made it back to the car without incident and then went home okay. But we came back during the daytime a few days later and looked around for trail cams that we may have missed because of how dark it was. We didn't find anything, and we still don't know what that flash was. It was pretty creepy, but we had a lot of fun that night. If anyone can think of what it might have been, please... Let me know. This is a story that my aunt told me years ago. My aunt and her family lived in a very rural and backwoods area of Lincoln County, West Virginia. She said that her father would go fox hunting periodically. He and other men would travel up the mountains to their camp. There, they would let their dogs run foxes and spend the evening talking and telling stories amongst themselves. My aunt had many siblings, and this was not uncommon back in the 1950s backwoods West Virginia. Her mother decided that she would walk with several of the younger children up to her husband's, my aunt's father's, camp. My aunt was one of the party. She said that they walked a long way back up to the mountain and spent a few hours relaxing and spending time with their dad. The group had such a nice time that they didn't realize how late it had gotten. My aunt's father gave his wife a lantern in order for her and the kids to be able to see on their long journey back down the mountain. As the group left, the light from Fox Hunter's camp eventually faded out of sight. As they walked on down the mountain, her mother noticed a small ball of light about the size of a softball coming down the mountain behind them. Thinking it was her husband needing something, she and the children stopped on the trail to wait. As they stood there, the light slowly made its way down the path and into better view. My aunt said the closer that it got, they could see that it wasn't a lantern, but a ball of light floating about three feet from the ground. She said once her mother realized this, she put the children in front of her and told them to run as fast as they could down that old trail that was cut into the mountain. My aunt told me that they all ran as fast as they could down the hill. She said that the faster they ran, the faster the ball of light moved. My aunt said that they finally got to where their home was and ran inside and locked the door. According to my aunt, they were all terrified. When they finally got the courage to look out the window, they saw nothing. My husband and his sister went hiking in September or November of 2020 when this happened. They were hiking Sharp Top in southwest Virginia. They hiked the entire trail without incident, but as they were coming back down the trail, back towards their car, they noticed a black, opaque figure at the foot of the trail near the road. This figure was amorphous, and they saw white at the top where a face would be, but no other features. They said it was roughly five or six feet tall, and glided across the road into the tree line. Once it hit the tree line, it disappeared soundlessly. Mind you, it's fall, so leaves were on the ground everywhere. They would have heard some sort of noise and seen it since the trees were bare, but nothing. He said they were roughly 40 yards away from it, but it was still light enough out for them to fully see what was happening. This was my husband's first experience with anything paranormal. But my sister-in-law has experienced some other things, just not like this in the past. We haven't found any similar accounts to this black figure with a white face in Appalachia, so I'm wondering if anyone has ever heard of similar accounts. We're familiar with most folklore in the area, but my husband isn't resonating with any of them yet.
I debated whether or not I talked about this as it's a super short blip of time and I didn't see anything, but I ultimately decided maybe I could find answers to what could have made this noise. My husband, 28, and I, 25, stay in a small town that borders the massive redwood forest. We're about 15 minutes or less from the trees of mystery. We live on a street that was built in the middle of the forest for whatever reason. There are two large patches, maybe 5 to 15 miles, one of which has a small forest bridge that connects to an even larger forest on either end of our street. I will also say, we tend to be night owls, preferring to stay up late and wake up late. So, getting to what happened, my husband was ready for bed while I sat under the covers. It was a nice, cool fall night after a hot day. So I opened the window to just curl up under my five blankets with the wonderful fall air on my face. While laying on my phone, not asleep yet, I started to look up the next full moon. I just kind of like that sort of stuff. I was surprised to find that the moon was at 100% tonight. So I looked outside my window from the bedside and confirmed the amount of light on the ground outside on our street, which has no street lights since it's an old street was very well lit in a bluish moon-toned color. I was kind of like, oh neat, then sat back down on my phone. I like to wait for my husband to get into bed before I start falling asleep. I don't know if it's a comfort thing or not, but I usually can't sleep well in the bed unless he's near me. I was wide awake, sitting there for about two to five-ish minutes, listening to the crickets outside, when I heard a man scream up my street. It sounded like it was coming from two to three doors down, near to one of the edges of the forest. At first, it was just a fearful scream, but the more it continued, the more I realized, oh, it's just a silly guy making a fake scream. Why? It's 2 a.m. But the scream went on for far too long, and then at the tail end, it went from this silly fake scream to a deep, gurgling roar, similar to... I don't know when someone is transforming into something in the movies, but at the same time, the first part of the scream didn't sound real, like it was forced or pretend or just to pretend to scream. I don't recall whether or not the crickets went silent. I just know that I was no longer trying to listen to them after hearing that crazy noise. I've wondered what it was, maybe Sasquatch, a werewolf slash dog man, some other creepy critter all the way to a person doing it. But no one could go that deep or that long of a scream. Plus, it echoed and felt like live sound, not a speaker system or anything like that. I've gone through every possibility. Has anyone else experienced something similar to this or even know what it could have possibly been? All right, this happened about a year or two ago when I was asked to watch the neighbor's dog for a bit when they went on vacation. For context, I live in a super heavily forested rural community. Neighbors asked that I stay at their house while watching their dog, Cyclone, and I happily oblige. I am taking Cyclone on his usual route along some local hiking trails that connect to the neighborhood that are often tracked during the summer. But this was late fall, so they were deserted in anticipation of the snow. Of course, it's sunset and I'm just trying to get side a pee so we can head back inside. I let him off leash to do his thing, but he has other plans. He takes off into the woods and I wait for him to come back for about five minutes before following him. I'm calling his name and following his trail when I come up behind him, about a hundred yards off the trail. He's chewing on a stick and my patience for the night is gone, so I walk over to clip onto his lead again and take him home. Turns out, It wasn't a stick. It was a bone. A large bone that likely was the leg of some animal. I freeze, as the bears have already hibernated, and there are only two coyotes in the area. I take a closer look and see a paw still attached to the bone, and lose it. I grab Cyclone and book it back to the house. The next morning, I go out with Cyclone again, still freaked out but determined to figure out whose dog had been snatched by apparently something. Y'all, it was a deer leg, and half the body was right around the corner. 
It had clearly died of natural causes, and I was clearly an idiot for getting so scared last night. So there's my dumb backwoods scare, because apparently locals can also completely forget that they are not the only things in the woods. In January of 2020, my brother, fiance, kid, and I decided to go backpacking in southern Indiana. We stayed at a shelter that is close to the Ohio River. At about 1 p.m., my brother and my kid were asleep, and my fiance and I were out by the fire just talking. My fiance got scared and pointed to multiple lights in the woods. It looked like there were five to ten people out there with flashlights coming towards us. I was going to get my brother up so he could see it for himself and get his gun if need be. But before I could get him up, one by one, the lights started to disappear. We spoke with him about it the next morning, and he said it was probably lights from the boats that pass on the river. The next night, we waited for the boats to pass by again, and none of them made the same lights as the night before. And because of where we saw the lights, it seemed that it was too far away from the river to reflect that far into the woods. Then... Around 5 to 5.30 in the morning of the third day while I was laying in the shelter and everyone else was asleep, I was woken up by what sounded like people whispering. Then, I saw a shadow or something through the cracks of the shelter. When I poked my head out of the door, nothing was there. We've been back to that exact spot multiple times and haven't experienced anything like this since. So I came across this group when trying to research my experience, and I'm new to Reddit, but wanted to post my experiences. I've seen other posts online of similar experiences. I was backpacking last weekend in the Allegheny National Forest in northwest Pennsylvania with a friend of mine and his teenage son. We hiked the Minister Creek Trail and set up camp that night about four miles away from the trailhead. We saw only two other parties that day, and neither were overnighting on the trail. We explored the area we camped in extensively to find the best campsite and did not see any other campers within at least a mile in either direction. The rest of the forest was heavily grown hillsides on either side of the valley without anywhere good to set up camp. About 2 a.m., I was woken up by the sound of drumming. It sounded like a single drum and was a rhythmic beat like bum, bum, bum. 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 If anyone is familiar with the Cleveland Indians baseball team, now the Guardians, they used to have a guy who would beat on a native-style drum, and it sounded exactly like that. It was loud and close-sounding, and it reverberated throughout the valley we were camped in. If I were to guess, I would say it sounded as if it were within a 100 yards of our location. I got up and out of my tent to investigate and my friend had also been woken up by the sound. We couldn't see anything other than the dark woods around us. This continued for at least two hours until I was able to fall back asleep. The next morning, we woke up and all was normal. We continued on our hike and did not see any other campers around. I have no clue what it was. I've watched YouTube videos of grouse drumming, and that definitely wasn't it. Obviously, it could have been a person and likely was but sitting out in the middle of the woods at night, drumming on a drum for at least two hours straight without skipping a beat? Perhaps there is some Native American ritual which calls for this? I guess the story isn't too creepy, but I've been obsessing over the answer to this since Sunday morning. Let me describe how the woods are shaped for this story. I was in the same woods that I talked about in my old post, The Friendly Woods. I talked about it in the past tense in the old post because someone had bought our house, but I'm still living here. But I'm about to move. 
It's about half a mile long and 150 yards thick between some houses and not very busy road. Sometimes I feel like someone is watching me here, but I've never had a weird experience until now. Anyway, I'll get on to it. After the last weekend, I wasn't in the forest, as I had some work and was overall too busy to go out and spend some time alone in it. Last Monday, I walk into my little camp and I find it trashed. A makeshift bench that I made was wrenched apart. A sign and a signpost saying camp was cast over 15 feet from where it stood. An entire wall of a cabin I made was torn down, and some guidelines holding the tarp on top in place were cut. There was no storm over the weekend, just a little rain if I remember right. Strange, I thought, but maybe some teenagers or a neighbor decided to vent some frustration by wrecking a camp. The damage wasn't that bad and I fixed everything. Today, I was splitting some wood and carving it into little pieces for a game that I play with some of my friends. I take a break and text a friend of mine for a bit. We talk about the forest, and I tell him that the forest I was in is not scary and that I feel safe there. Just as I press send, about 50 yards behind me, hidden behind a hill, I hear a terrible scream. Not a fox scream. I've heard those. Not human either, but more like a woman being murdered crossed with a car screeching to a halt. But that's not what it was. I turn around and grab a knife off my belt. That was strange. Just as I tell my friend that I'm not afraid, I hear a scream. I just wonder what y'all thought of that. Maybe I had my mind on skinwalkers and my brain misconstrued some sort of normal noise. I don't know. Does anyone have any suggestions? I had a really weird experience in Congaree National Park outside of Columbia last winter that brought me to these kind of subreddits. It's a beautiful boardwalk that goes through the swamps and the cypress forest in them. I lived in Columbia, South Carolina and frequent in CNP, so I'm familiar with the area. I often would jump the fence and walk the border walk at night as it's super peaceful to walk the swamp and hear all the wildlife. They never have a ranger or guard there after hours, so I was always alone. The last time I did this was in October of 2021. I was taking my usual stroll with my flashlight in hand. I should mention, between the insects and frogs, the sound is loud. But then it completely stopped when I was about a mile in. I heard what I thought was my wife call me from the trailhead, but she wasn't there. I was alone and she was out of town. I then heard water sloshing to my right and saw nothing with my flashlight. I chalked it up to me being tired and I kept moving. The wildlife started up shortly after and everything was fine. Maybe 15 minutes later I noticed it got eerily quiet again and I heard swamp water sloshing on my left. But this time it was more deliberate, like somebody walking. I was in a thick portion of the cypress and couldn't see more than 20 feet in front of me. And then, I heard my wife's voice again. Again, she wasn't with me, and she was out of town, certainly not moving through the swamp at 1am. I saw what looked like a human silhouette move between the trees for a split second, but it was off. Very skinny, pale, and taller than me at six feet. Like I said, this is a boardwalk that's in a swamp in the boonies. Nobody is walking around in the water at night without a light. Or ever, honestly. And I don't know of any animal that big that walks in a bipedal pattern and have spent my entire life in the outdoors. I feel like I should add that I wasn't high or sleep deprived. I just liked the woods at night. I was so freaked out by this that I came to Reddit and dove into some of the stories on this subreddit as well as others. I'm convinced that I encountered a crawler or wendigo or something else that can mimic voices. There is no way some meth head was stumbling through the swamp miles from civilization that sounds like wifey. But then again, it is also South Carolina.
this is a true story. I'll return to the spot at some point this summer and take photos to add for reference. I've been sitting with this story for many years now. It's not as exciting and creepy as some of the other stories that I find on here, but it is eerie, and I wanted to see if anyone could give me an idea of what might have happened. My aunt has owned a large piece of land, over 100 acres in northwest Connecticut, for many years now. Her property is located in a state park that is mostly uninhabited and only frequented by backpackers. Her land is well off of any main roads, and we have to drive through a lot of forest to reach her house. She bought the land and remodeled the old house that was already built on it, so it was more livable. And going up to visit her has always been my favorite thing to do. I've been going yearly since I was a baby, and have spent many countless hours exploring the woods, creeks, and land around the house. We call it the farm, although it's not a true agricultural or livestock farm. My aunt does have rescue miniature horses, alpacas, donkeys, and back in the day there were also ducks. The animals are on one part of the property, where area has been cleared out for them to graze, get fat, and be happy. The rest of the farm is untouched woodlands. In the early 2000s, she decided to install a 12-foot fencing around the property, although it only encloses about 80 acres of the land that she owns. She explained to me that she could not stand the sounds of the coyotes howling right outside her window at night, and that she has had some creepy encounters while living there. She did not go into details of these at this time because I was just a young child. She lives alone, so I understand why she wanted to feel a semblance of security in those deep woods. We are originally from the bayous of Louisiana, so being in this type of environment was all new to us. Anyway, despite being initially unfamiliar with the land, I eventually learned to navigate the area very well as a child. I had a few favorite spots, and one was up a small foothill in the deepest part of the woods. I would go up so often that eventually a small path was established in the brush, and I would bring my cousins with me to show them my little oasis. In 2008, when I was about 10 years old, I took a summer trip to my aunt's and brought my best friend Alex with me. She and I often took trips there during our childhood, and this was not her first time accompanying me to the farm. I remember that we were in the woods at my favorite spot, sitting together and listening to Katy Perry while playing Doodle Jump on our new iPod Touches. This makes me laugh to remember, but we were just trying to enjoy some nature while getting our fill of new tech, I guess. We were there for a while, enjoying ourselves and talking about random kid stuff, when there was this shift in the air. Almost like a suffocating stillness and silence settled upon the woods. I paused the music and looked at Alex, who was already staring at me with a concerned and worried expression on her face. We stayed still and silent for a minute, tilting our heads to listen to the woods and search out any of the unfamiliar sounds that normally crescendoed day and night across the farm. There were no birds, no summer bugs, and the trees almost seemed to stand frozen in place, as if the light winds that normally rustled their leaves left us completely. It was a vulnerable, terrible feeling that I knew Alex felt too. Then began the sound of footsteps coming from even deeper in the woods. It took a moment for me to determine what the sound was, but the distinct rhythm of weight being picked up and put down on leaves and brush was impossible not to notice. It was bipedal and heavy, and was coming up towards us from a steep slope down the side of the mountain slash foothill. I remember thinking that it was impossible for a human to move so easily through that part of the woods, since it was very thick with growth, fallen branches, trees, and rocks, even making it hard for an agile small child to navigate, let alone a large adult. It felt as if the woods lay still in wait while these footsteps made their way swiftly up the steep incline towards us. Do you hear that? I asked Alex in a whisper. She nodded. It sounds like footsteps, I continued. She nodded again, looking like she was about to burst into tears. I took her hand and began running the makeshift path with her, trying not to fall or let her lag behind me at all. We did not stop until we reached the house. I don't think we told anyone that day, because we were just too shaken to even comprehend what might have been out there. The next day, I asked Alex if she would go back out to the spot with me. She was very hesitant at first, 
but eventually agreed and said we could go look for signs of another human. We made our way back, nervous, but determined to discover what had invaded our little sanctuary. When we reached the spot, I looked down towards the direction we had heard the footsteps. I think I even slid down a bit to investigate passable indentations in the brushes and leaves. I did not go too far, because I was about to lose my nerve, and I hadn't noticed much anyway, so I quickly climbed back up to where Alex waited nervously for me. We decided that it must have been some sort of animal, or deer, despite every logical explanation indicating otherwise. I knew what deer sounded like, and that was not a deer, but I wanted to forget and have fun again. We took our iPods out and began the same ritual of relaxing and playing video games while chatting about nonsense. It seemed like things were back in their natural order again, so we quickly forgot about the terrifying experience and let our naive childlike wonder take over. After a little while, the stillness returned, and it happened so quickly it felt as if the forest took a grasp and never exhaled. This time, the footsteps started almost immediately. They were louder and coming from a different direction. The best way I can explain their location is that they were in a similar spot to the day before, but somewhat more to the right where the forest was very dark and the incline to reach was less steep. I did not wait too long to run, but it was too long enough to realize that the sound was faster, closer, and definitely not a deer or bear. I knew it was close enough that it would be upon us any moment if we did not flee. So without another word, Alex and I took off and ran as fast as humanly possible out of those woods. It's not a super exciting story, but that is my first creepy experience in those woods. I have since had more, as I am an avid backpacker and love the outdoors. But the experiences on our land must have always been the most bizarre and inexplainable. If anyone has any ideas about what this was, please comment or let me know. I think about it every time I am in any woods. It still sends chills up my spine to remember. And for some extra info, the area we were at is pretty far away from the main house and any other civilization. We asked my aunt if there were any men on the property and she said no, there were not. She also confirmed that the gates were in working order. Although, it wouldn't be hard for a bear to breach them, or for a fox to dig underneath them. My family owns a lot of property in Halotes, Texas. Our ranch actually has a ton of history. I grew up on this ranch. My dad owned a small single wide trailer. We were neighbors with my tia and tío. They were around a hundred yards to the left of us. The back of our trailer was placed really close to thick woods, so I didn't really have a backyard. We were kind of plopped right in the middle of the woods, but our driveway was connected to the main dirt road if that makes any sense. Well, I always felt creeped out by the backyard area and our back door. Like I said, we didn't really have a backyard. It was a heavy, uncleared wooded area. We never used the back door. It was always locked with one of those chain locks on the inside. I was a very active kid. I couldn't ever sit still and chill. I always had to be outside exploring. Usually, my cousins and I would explore the ranch, build forts, and ride four-wheelers. But there were times when I would be exploring alone. I remember there was one time I was looking around the trailer alone, trying to find a good spot to build a fort. I was around eight years old at the time. I went to the right end of the trailer to explore. This area had a large area of cleared brush, but behind me was the back wooded area. I remember walking around more focused on finding a good fort spot, when out of nowhere I felt a very uneasy feeling. My attention immediately went to the back wooded area. I felt as if someone was staring at me. The feeling was so intense, I booked it back into my house. I don't remember any other key details about that experience other than feeling like someone was near and staring at me. There was another time, not long after the staring feeling that I experienced, where I came home from my cousin's house to get some clothes, since I was staying the night at her house around 9pm. 
My cousin's driveway connects to the main dirt road in the same area as my driveway. Anyway, when I opened the front door and walked into the trailer, I noticed the back door was completely open. Again, I was staying at my cousin's house, the next driveway over, and my dad was down the road at the local bar. No one had been in the trailer for hours. My dad never opened the back door ever for any reason. I immediately felt very spooked and hightailed it back to my cousin's house without getting the clothes that I initially went there to pick up. There's many other things that happen that I have experienced on the ranch, but this experience is by far the most alarming for us. It was during the summer of 2007. We were 11 or 12 years old at the time. We were at my cousin's house. My dad took us to Hollywood Video earlier in the day to rent a movie. This was what he did to make up for being at the bar until 2 a.m. We ended up renting Texas Chainsaw Massacre and decided to watch it around 1 a.m. We chose to rent this movie and watch it at that time because we loved to get spooked. Well, after we finished the movie, it was around 2 a.m. We were still up and wanted to party, so we decided we would walk to my trailer and pick up my boombox so we could listen to our CDs we just burned on LimeWire and jam out and dance. Remember, my cousin's driveway is connected to my main road parallel to where my driveway was. We get to walking, and out of nowhere we hear a chainsaw going off in the hill, about 40 to 50 yards to the left of us, way too close for comfort. Again, this was 2 a.m. in the middle of nowhere. All the land surrounding us is owned by close family. None of them would ever opt to clear land or operate a chainsaw at 2 a.m. in pitch black. We had to use flashlight to see the dirt road in front of us. That's how dark it was. When we heard the chainsaw, we all paused and looked at each other super confused. Once we processed what was going on, we ran as fast as we could to my trailer, only because at that point it was closer than my cousin's home. Unfortunately, my dad wasn't home. He was out doing whatever he was doing, so we couldn't tell him about what we just heard or ask for a ride back to my cousin's. None of us had a cell phone at the time. We ended up grabbing my loaded 22 and walked back with it in hand. Luckily, we didn't hear the chainsaw again. To this day, my cousins and I are perplexed over this experience. There is no logical explanation for the chainsaw that we heard at 2 a.m. In a weird way, it almost sounded like a very loud recording of a chainsaw rather than an actual chainsaw. Again, none of my family would wake up at 2 a.m. and start clearing land or brush or play very loud chainsaw recordings for any reason. And I feel especially weirded out about this because we had just got done watching the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Even though we were trying to get spooked, we know this wasn't just in our heads, nor were we expecting to hear what we heard. We all heard it clear as day at the same time. My cousins and I have told our family about this experience on a few occasions. My family's response is always weird. My dad got short with us and said, Well, y'all shouldn't have been out at that time. My tia said something similar. Well, this is why we always tell y'all to come inside once it gets dark. Some extra info. Our family has been in Texas since it was a part of Mexico. My cousins and I are a part of the Daughters of the Republic of Texas. Our history runs deep. We also have native slash indigenous lineage. However, I don't know much about that. Anyway, I thought I would share my very mild, but very real and creepy experiences. What I am about to describe will sound like a cheap cliche movie script, but this did indeed happen. Even at home, barely anybody believes me without confirmation from the other parties involved. Buckle up, it's a long haul. Autumn 19, in British Columbia, Canada. I am from Germany, but spent half a year in Canada as part of my bachelor degree. I barely got back before COVID hit. I was 22 years old at the time, and the other people involved were about the same age. Another foreign student and I befriended this local Canadian student. We all had the same interests and humor, and the dude became a very good friend of ours. He told us about the local area, and we spent a week in the summer with him and his father at their very remote 
cabin near some woods. They taught us how to handle guns there and let us shoot a lot. Then fall came, and we had a lot of free time due to being finished up with all of our papers. So our buddy proposed that we spend a few days at his dad's cabin, this time without his father. We went, absolutely, because we could load up on booze and weed and have a great time there, just living the life. Three close dudes in the woods gaming and getting wasted. Sounds great, right? After loading up on all the supplies, the first three days were very calm. On the first day, just like the last time I was there, I barely slept and was generally tense. This is because I am naturally a very paranoid guy, and I often go into alert mode in situations which is often mocked by my friends. In this case, what freaked me out the most was the fact that we were far away from civilization, and you never understand how quiet your surroundings can be until you've spent some time in a remote area like this, which led me to often just standing in the dark at night listening to the surroundings of the cabin. But after the few first days, I got less paranoid. After all, I was with friends, was constantly high, and we were quite armed and dangerous. Probably most dangerous to ourselves, though, to be honest. Day four came. We spent the day attempting to hunt in the woods, mostly just chilling under trees with a beer and a rifle in hand. But in the evening, it started to rain heavily. After an hour, we were starting to see lightning in the distance, with quite a lot of time passing between lightning and thunder, which meant the thunderstorm itself was still some time away. So, we avoided our incompetent hunting attempts and started trekking back to the cabin. It took us about an hour to reach it, due to it already being very dark and the rain creating unsafe footing. For context, you should know that once you spend a few days in the wilderness and haven't seen a soul other than your friends for days, you can become quite careless about your surroundings. I think you can imagine why I'm telling you that last part. So, we enter the cabin. At that time, the thunderstorm was raging full on. We put away our gear and changed clothes, except for our guns. Yeah, I know. Drugs and guns are a horrible combination, and I wouldn't mix that stuff nowadays. But we were drilled quite well by Canadian friend's dad regarding trigger discipline, safety, etc. And man, I really miss spooning my rifle while sleeping. We cozied down in the living room at a table, started a YouTube video, and began playing cards. Barely 20 minutes passed since we returned, and at the time, we didn't bother closing the curtains in the living room, because thunderstorms are super cool. So imagine that we were three guys sitting around a table, occasionally in awe at the weather outside while playing cards. In such a remote place, it's extremely dark outside. Without a full moon and clear skies, it's pitch black. The only lamps we have are old, vintage looking, and dimmer than my phone's screen. What comes next is how my also non-local friend has described what he saw. While sipping from his beer, another lightning went off. He spit it out instantly after the lightning came and screamed loudly and stood up. No words, just the sound of panic. My Canadian friend and I were instantly perplexed and looked at him. There's somebody outside. He started rambling about how, in that split second, the lightning illuminated the outside of the cabin. He saw a person standing a bit of distance away from the cabin looking directly at us. Now, this is what I meant when I said cliche horror story, and barely anybody believes me at first. But trust me, this did happen. My non-local friend is obviously on full panic. His face looks anxious. This communicated to our Canadian buddy and me that this guy wasn't just messing with us. He did see somebody outside. I grabbed my rifle and pulled the bolt to rack another round into the chamber. I feel that warm sensation running down my spine of my body releasing adrenaline. I tried to stay far away from the window, stare into the darkness outside, but I can't see anything. While our Canadian friend rushed into his room to grab his pistol, I start panicking even more because I realize we didn't lock the door. Why would we? We haven't seen anyone in days and are in the middle of the wilderness. So I run to the door and lock it. Our friend returns with his pistol, which he grabbed because there was a flashlight attached to it. He carefully approached the window, then changed his pace from sneaky to fast, and pushed the window open with one hand, while the other hand was aiming the handgun outside. I wish I was any good at drawing, 
because what we saw next when our friend turned on the flashlight was the most terrifying image I have ever seen. It is burned into my mind. The fact that I cannot share that image with other people has been bugging me for three years now. The light turns on. What we saw in that moment was a man, tall and slim, dressed in all black, with a hooded raincoat which he has pulled over his head, almost covering his eyes. But not far away from the cabin, just a few steps away from the window, not standing as our friend yelled earlier, but crouching, looking directly at us with clenched eyes and a terrifying little smirk on one side of his mouth. Another lightning flashes, and for that moment we were all frozen. The image of what we saw must have shocked the other guys as much as it did me, because nobody said anything for a few seconds. There is a hard to explain dreadful feeling about seeing something like this. In a storm, in the middle of nowhere, a person dressed in a black raincoat is suddenly crouching so close to you and facing you. Our Canadian buddy was aiming his pistol plus attached flashlight at the also frozen crouch smirking man and just yelled out with a slight stutter and a higher pitched voice than I've ever heard from him. Get away from us or we will shoot. I guess that's the moment after his eyes adjusted. The raincoat man realized that this was not just a flashlight but a gun, and I was standing next to my friend with a hunting rifle in my arm. Raincoat man's slight smirk changed to something where I'm unsure if it was shock or rage. All this was happening in less than a minute. While my friend kept yelling, I was just frozen. The raincoat figure turned by about 90 degrees towards the nearest tree line and went from crouched to full sprint quickly. He ran away to the right side of our window. Two of us poked their head out of the window to see exactly where he was going. But with the heavy rainfall and darkness, we could only barely make out anything in the distance of that tree line. After a few minutes of just looking at each other in disbelief, we decided to pop off a few rounds outside the window to prove that we were for real. When the shock wore off, we decided to call the police. They asked me a lot of questions on the phone to describe the location of the cabin and a description of the man who just almost crept up on us, totally unsuspecting and only revealed due to lightning and luck. Due to us being in such a remote area, the cops told us it'd at least take one or two hours for someone to come out. They asked because of the weather and the time if it'd be all right if they send someone out tomorrow to talk to us about the details. Given how the man saw that we were armed, he probably wouldn't come back again. We agreed. We discussed just jumping in the truck and leaving right now, but us idiots were too lazy to refuel the truck. The idea of doing this now in the dark and in the heavy rain was just too frightening. I kept thinking about this guy lurking in the darkness and picking us off one by one. We spend the night sleeping in shifts. One person was awake and standing guard, the others at least attempting to sleep. When my turn came, the rain had died down. I turned off all the lights, opened a window, and just sat there in the darkness, trying to listen for any sound that I could hear, and looking out the windows to scan the area. Let me tell you, when you're standing in the darkness, for hours in full alert mode, just trying to sit still, listen, and look around you, you have a lot of time to think and reiterate what just happened. Close to the middle of the next day, two cops arrived. We had to give them a detailed report of what happened, when it happened, and had to show them in which direction the raincoat shade ran off to. They said they'll organize for a patrol to comb through the woods, but that might take a while because they need experienced outdoorsmen, etc. Sadly, we didn't see any of the details of this man's face. We couldn't tell if he was young or old, only that he was tall and clean-shaven. The chances of finding who exactly that was, and finding out what the hell he was attempting to do, were very small though one of the officers expressed that this whole happening was deeply worrying. We left the cabin a few hours after the police left, and Canadian Guy's dad insisted we stay at his place at least for a day until we feel safe again. He also wanted to hear every last detail and figured that the time has come to install cameras around the cabin. I don't remember this part for sure, but I believe that I heard later the dad and his brother went back to the cabin and just sat there in the dark waiting for the raincoat man to return. But I never heard any of the results, so I guess he must have gone hunting in other areas. I never heard from the cops again. Next January, I left Canada and returned home. My Canadian friend was called in for an interview a few months later, 
and it seemed like the police were still seriously investigating this, looking for the guy who crept up on the cabin during a thunderstorm. The image of that crouched raincoat figure completely wet and surrounded by darkness, so close to our cabin, is burned in my mind. I will most likely never forget this. I still sometimes turn off all the lights and just look out the windows in silence, trying to listen for sounds, even though I am on the other side of the world now. We've speculated a lot about what it was. The winning theory is that this guy most certainly had sinister intentions. This did not look like just an attempt at burglary. Remember, we had dim lights on. You could see that there was somebody inside the cabin. This guy was creeping towards us in a raincoat during a thunderstorm. When my friend yelled out that he saw somebody, this guy went from walking slash standing to crouching, and he went closer towards the window. I suspect the raincoat man wanted to check what kind of victim was on the menu, and I don't really want to imagine what he had in store if there were two unarmed girls there, in a cabin, in the middle of nowhere. We didn't see any headlights passing the clearing the cabin was on. The guy also had no backpack or anything, just the raincoat and black weather, appropriate clothing. I'd bet my soul that this guy was a man on a mission, who knew exactly what he was doing and what he was well prepared for. While writing this post, I also started thinking about the logistics of it all. The guy must have a camp, or at least a car hidden somewhere in those woods. You can't sustain yourself out there otherwise. I also got the feeling that he either came upon the cabin during the storm itself, or that he spotted us in the woods during the hunting we did before. We moved slowly, while also not being shy with waving our lights around, and in total pitch darkness wilderness, a proper flashlight must have been as easy to spot as the beacons of Gondor, so he might have tracked us through the woods until we reached the cabin. If anybody has heard about similar things happening in the area of British Columbia near Vancouver, please let me know. That mystery has a grip on me for the rest of my life. Sometimes, I still dream of this raincoat figure creeping closer towards me with each flash of lightning. Thank you for reading. This happened to my roommate and I two years ago when we drove into the National Forest just outside of the town we live in. We go to a small college in New England, about three hours from any major city. For context, this forest has quite a few urban legends surrounding it, and the local community, although they do go there often, have a lot of superstitions about how to be safe while there. I had just broken up with my partner, and my roommate could sense I was feeling down. Finals were just around the corner, so she decided to help me get my mind off of things and suggested we go to a nice spot she had found last week and just chill and de-stress. We took a couple of beers with us and drove to this secluded spot in the forest. From the moment we left the main asphalt road in the forest, I saw a couple of things that unsettled me. You could see the abandoned houses of a ghost town from the higher ground the road was on, and we saw this old doll hanging from a rope in the tree. Creepy stuff, but we didn't really give it a second thought and kept driving. We got to a clearing and parked our cars behind some trees, popped open the back of our SUV and started just talking and playing music. About 10 minutes into this, two cars appeared from the road and parked in the clearing. My friend didn't pay them attention. Instead, she kept talking. But as I was facing them from where I sat, I couldn't stop seeing what they did. A guy popped out of each car, talked for a few minutes, and then I saw them take out a long object covered in a dark plastic bag from the back of one of the cars. This is when I noticed these guys had guns. And not like shotguns, which I see often in this town, but handguns. Then they started lighting the bag on fire. I told my friend to get down, and she turned around and saw them for the first time. Black smoke was rising from the bag, and between trying to keep my head down and steal glances at them, I saw them take out a second object and heard them shoot at it right before they set it on fire. I don't know how long my friend and I were lying there in silence, but it was definitely enough time to let the terror sink in and whisper to each other how much we loved each other in case this was what we thought it was. At some point I looked up and saw that they were pointing at our car and saw them walking into the woods, maybe trying to follow our tracks or trying to look for us. 
All I know is that right then, I told my friend to jump in the driver's seat and make a run for it. I shut the back door, and between that and the car starting up, the guys heard it and started running towards us, then ran towards one of their cars and hopped in. We went over a hill, and were driving way above what was safe for dirt roads on a hillside. Then we lost them. We drove to a neighboring town and roamed around for a while just to make sure that no one was following us, before we went back to our dorm. That day, we tried to make fun of the whole situation and got really drunk before finally breaking down and crying from knowing we had seen something we were not supposed to. We were at first terrified of not telling anyone, but eventually did tell officers on campus who contacted the police, but never found anything. In May 2009, I had just broken up with my girlfriend of almost three years. We had moved from Calgary to Toronto and were still stuck living together after the breakup, as we didn't know many people in the city yet. Needless to say, the situation was pretty stressful and upsetting. So when a buddy I was going to school with at the time suggested a weekend camping slash fishing trip, I jumped at the chance. He grew up in an area about an hour outside of Toronto called Flameboro. It's really beautiful. Loads of lush forests, farmers' fields, and small rivers and creeks. We decided to camp and fish along a creek called Grindstone Creek. It's close to some wetlands, and the fishing is supposed to be great. We ended up setting up our camp in what was probably a farmer's field. I'm guessing it was trespassing on our part. Bordered by a gorgeous forest, we spent the evening fishing, shooting the crap, drinking some quality craft beers, etc., As it got darker, we made a little fire and roasted potatoes and hot dogs. All in all, it was a really good night. We turned in just after midnight. We shared a tent. My buddy fell asleep before me and I stayed up playing on my phone until probably around 1.30. I must have drifted off because the next thing I remember was being woken up by a high-pitched yipping type noise. I was kind of groggy and it took me a moment to fully wake up. The yipping was incessant and it sounded like a weird coyote. I laid there for a moment, listening, and then started playing on my phone again. The noise was annoying as hell. I tried ignoring it, but it sounded like it was getting closer. Finally, it sounded like it had to be no more than 10 feet from the tent. At this point, I was getting a little unsettled. I had seen coyotes in Calgary before, and I thought of them as pretty harmless. They never looked much bigger than a smallish dog. But what if this one was rabbit or something? What if it could smell our food? I have a pretty bad anxiety disorder, so I'm prone to worrying about these types of things. I nudged my buddy to see if he was awake, and he was. The noise woke him up, too. We discussed what to do about the coyote, as we hadn't brought anything to scare off critters. Not a BB gun, nothing. Finally, he decided he would shine the flashlight on it and holler a lot, hoping to scare him off. He unzipped the tent, and I watched him pointing the flashlight out into the darkness. I'll never forget what happened next. His legs suddenly went all wobbly, and he sort of stumbled backwards into the tent. He had a really dumbfounded look on his face when he looked at me and babbled, It's not a coyote. It's a dude. It's some weird dude. Normally, I would have thought he was messing with me. I'm a huge wimp and scare easily. I won't even watch horror movies. But I've never seen someone look that scared, and I never want to see that expression on someone's face again so I knew he wasn't pulling my leg. The weird yipping and howling type noises were still going on, and in retrospect, it really didn't sound like a coyote, but I guess our groggy states, it was a way for our brains to make sense of it. Anyway, he kept telling me just to look out the tent flap to make sure he's not crazy. At this point, I was having a full-blown anxiety attack. My heart was racing, but I had to look. So, I slowly peeked out of the flap and waited for my eyes to adjust. And that's when I saw him. He was standing only a few arms lengths away from the tent. He was swaying a little and wearing a baseball cap. What made it awful, though, was really creepy, was that he was wearing women's lingerie. That's when I knew that there was most likely something very wrong with this guy, if the making high-pitched noises at strangers in a tent in the middle of the night didn't give it away. 
After I pulled my head back inside the tent, my buddy and I discussed what to do. Finally, we decided to yell at the guy to F off. My buddy started yelling. The noise stopped. It was dead silent, and that's when we heard footsteps running towards the tent. They stopped right outside the tent, but we didn't waste any time. We started yelling again. With that, we heard him walk by the tent and head off. Sounded like he was moving towards the road. Needless to say, we lie awake, petrified until the first sign of sunlight. We discussed our experience on the way home, and we're both pretty embarrassed about how scared we got. It definitely was not manly on either of our parts. I think because we're both ashamed of how we let some weirdo freak us out so much, we haven't really ever talked about it since that day. So there you go. There's my weird story. Sometimes I wonder if things would have turned out differently if we were a couple of girls. I'm not saying it was some serial killer, but it seemed like he was testing who was in the tent. I guess I'll never know. And for that, I'm kind of glad. Back around 2004 or 2005, I was leaving a buddy's house headed home. He lived on Lake Ariel in Wayne County, Pennsylvania. I was a good 15 miles away, so I decided to take back roads to save time and avoid cops. As I crest this mountain road, I see a van off the side. Doors open, lights on. It's well after midnight and no one is on the road. I slowed my car, a 1989 Volkswagen ragtop, down to first gear, looking for a person or persons that may be hurt. Not a soul is around and the woods are quiet. The van off the road is not running, but all lights are on, and the driver's door is open. I remember thinking, dang, I don't have a self-service until the top of the mountain. I gotta call the cops. So I proceeded to go towards where I knew had cell service, maybe going 30 miles per hour tops. I knew this situation was messed up, but then it got worse. No more than three or so miles away, the brush thinned on the roadside so you had a better view of what's in the woods. I see movement, so I let off the gas, thinking I don't want to hit a deer. As I let off, this man, soaking in fresh blood, comes from the tree line and into the road. He's so covered in gore, I couldn't tell that it was a man at first. He stumbled out in front of the car and waved me down. I was in my rag top, top down, of course. He was yelling and grabbing at my door. I dropped into first and took off. Another mile or so, I had service and called the cops. Dude was obviously hurt, and his grab for my door scared me. There was a wide space on the mountain where I agreed to wait for the cops. They were there in under 10 minutes. While I waited, I put the top up, and then locked the doors. An officer took my statement, and he looked over my car with a torch. The guy from the woods left a bloody smear down my door. Another officer found the van, but couldn't locate the guy who came out of the woods. The cops let me go home and said they'd call if they needed anything further. Within a few days, I did get a call, saying the van was located, and they asked if I could describe the van. They never found him that night, and as far as I know, they never did. Apparently, the van was stolen, and the cops surmised this guy banged himself up and took off in a panic. As far as I know, they never did track him down. To this day, I keep a lookout for a bloody man running out of the woods. This experience is 100% true and has stuck with me. I'm a wilderness survival instructor and security contractor. A couple days ago, a student of mine and good friend who I had taken out into the woods before told me his dad just got 150 acres of land in a secluded, mountainous part of my state. It had a large amount of forest on it that hadn't been explored yet, as his dad was only building something for his horses that took up about 100 yards of the property, and his horses were free to roam at the moment. He said his dad got an insane deal on the property. My friend is now a dad of three, and I know he doesn't go out into the woods that often, so I agreed to go out with him, because it seemed really fun and I can imagine he needs a getaway every now and then. We're both indigenous, into cars, into wilderness survival, and all sorts of stuff, so we never run out of anything to talk about in the woods. His dad, however, told us that he didn't want anybody exploring the woods unless we had a gun. 
He said it was because he saw coyotes. Now, we're all indigenous here. We were raised in the same state. Coyotes don't actually attack people, really. My friend, who we'll call R.C., also told me a while back when he was first at the property he saw movement in the tree lines that was roughly human size and shape, but couldn't really tell since his eyesight isn't that good. I brought my AR and a small flint napping kit just for the fun of it, and we set off onto the property. We explored a lot of the rolling fields, creeks, multiple natural springs and ponds. Everything felt normal. It was a beautiful landscape. Eventually, we decided to get to the forested part of the property, as it hadn't been explored yet. As soon as we entered the tree line, the entire mood shifted. The forest had an ambiance of its own, very similar to the woods in the movie The Ritual. The woods were gray and dead silent save for the occasional creaking of tall, tired cedar trees. There was a very small stream running through the center of it, with sand that was black. It felt like we were surrounded, watched from all sides. It didn't take long before a very putrid stench hit our nostrils. It was the odor of rotting flesh. We decided to follow the smell and found the remains of three to four cows. I have the video. We examined the exposed skulls and couldn't find any bullet holes. It didn't appear to me that these cows had been put down. Something killed them, though, and their bones were spread over about 30 yards. There were large indentions in the dirt all around them that were very vague in their shape. We decided to press on into the woods. Now we were accompanied only by silence, the putrid odor of death, and the sound of our own heartbeats. We kept stopping at the stream, as I noticed several different types of tracks, large coyote tracks and something else that was large but intentionally avoided the sand it seemed. We pressed on into the woods until we started to find trees that had been bent over and pinned behind other trees while they were still alive. Something that could never, ever happen naturally. I have video of that too. We hiked on and found what I can only describe as a tool made of bone lying on the ground. It was extremely crude, but looked like some kind of scooping tool or knife. It was extensively photographed. It was disturbing, because although it looked primitive, it looked way more primitive than a person would make, but an intentionally shaped tool nonetheless. We hiked on until we found a clearing with a pond that had more large oval tracks surrounding it. On the other side of the pond, we found a very strange little tree structure. It was an A-frame. It had rocks placed up against it. However, it wasn't that sturdy, and the rocks were very peculiarly placed. We found no signs of any campfires around it. We found no camping trash. This isn't exactly a place you could hike to from a house. I photographed and made a video of that little hut thing. It was getting dark, so we decided we should head back. I had a flashlight on my AR, but I didn't want to rely on that in the dark with something that kills cows and makes tools out of their bones somewhere behind us. We made our way out of the forest and back to where the trucks were parked just in time before it got too dark to see. As we were leaving, we saw something on top of one of the hills that we couldn't identify, but didn't stick around to find out what it was. It's well worth mentioning the previous owner began construction of something on the property, abruptly halted construction, and left. Again, I have extensive photos of these things, so feel free to message me, and I will post updates as possible. I had previously posted this story with my wife's account a couple of days ago on r slash Bigfoot. I didn't know what we had seen. And it wasn't until someone replied with, feel free to post on r slash backwoods creepy. This caught me off guard, as I had never heard of Glimmerman slash Wendigo slash crawlers before. Now, I haven't read too much into this topic, as I have a lot going on. But I soon realized that this ties in just about everything that has happened since we moved in a year ago. I'm going to start with the seemingly unrelated incidents that have led up to this most recent eye-opening experience. About a year ago, I moved my family and I to a home 
way out in the woods in Tennessee. I wanted to be brief here, but I needed to get this off my chest. And after looking into this matter a little more, I have a lot more details that I think will paint a clear picture in the end, so please bear with me. The nights here can be extremely loud. Between the crickets, the tree frogs, and the cicadas, it can almost be deafening. One night, not too long after we moved in, I had forgotten something in my car and headed outside to get it. The first thing that struck me as odd was that my dog wouldn't go outside with me. My dog goes everywhere with me, as I am her whole world. But not this night. As I held the door open, she looked out, then looked up at me like nope. So I walked out and shut the door behind me. The second thing that caught me off guard was that there was not a peep. It was dead silent. Still, I shrugged this off and walked down my front steps and headed down to my car. When I had gotten about ten feet from my car, the hairs on the back of my neck stood up. I felt as though something was watching me. I looked around but saw nothing. After I reached in my car for what I had forgotten to grab earlier, I had this feeling like something was moving towards me. I took a step back and checked around me. All of a sudden, I heard one of my hedges next to me that lined the walkway to our front door rattle. At first, I thought it was a rabbit that I had spooked, as I had seen one just earlier in the day right where this was. A few seconds later, I heard the sound of a large rock, about the size of a cantaloupe, landing just a few feet away from me. It hit the walkway and bounced into a shrub. I drew my gun and called out and said whoever this was is about to be shot. After a few seconds of nothing, I began to think that maybe this was some local teenagers messing with the new people. I holstered my sidearm, turned, and started walking back to my front door. Almost as soon as I turned towards my house, I heard this deep, panting sound. It sounded like a huge dog. But what made me note back to my front door was that it sounded like it was right behind me. I leaped up my front porch, turned, and drew my gun, again expecting something right there. But again, there was nothing. A couple of weeks later, I was on my porch at night, sitting on a bench with my wife. She got up and walked inside to get something. And as soon as she shut the door, I heard that panting sound again. I couldn't see anything. Yet this sounded like it was right on top of me. The sound was coming from everywhere, and it was very loud. Again, I couldn't see anything, so I noped it back inside my house. Now at this point, I was questioning moving here. But after nothing else really happening, I let it go. A month or so later, it was really rainy and stormy. This is around 9 p.m., and my wife and I enjoy listening to the rain and talking about how relaxing the rain is. Me, growing up in Oregon, loved the rain, and for the past 10 years we lived in Vegas, where it would dump the entire year of rain in a day, then be bone dry for the rest of the year. For my wife, who grew up in Nevada, rain was such a rare thing. She loved going outside and watching it. So for us, this is an enjoyable experience. Except this night in particular, things took a weird turn. As we were sitting there talking about the rain and relaxing, my wife stops and said, Did you hear that? I said, No, what did you hear? She said, I swear, it sounded like a small child calling for help out in the woods beside our house. I said, No, I didn't hear anything. After a few moments of us listening intently, she said, There it is again. I said, I didn't hear anything, sweetie. Are you sure you're not just hearing things? She looked at me offended that I didn't hear anything and said, No, I'm positive. How could you not hear that? It was our son. I think he's out there and lost. I said, No, he's in the house sleeping on the couch. Then we both looked through the blinds that were open right behind us, and we could see all of our children laying there. She said, That's so weird. I swear it sounded like our son. I said, well, it isn't him. He's right there. Besides, I don't hear anything. She then stands up and says, wow, he's really crying out for help. I need to go look for him. Now at this point, if you knew my wife, you'd know that she is absolutely creeped out by the woods and wouldn't be caught dead walking into them during daylight, much less at night during a storm. I grabbed her hand and said, I have been listening intently and there is absolutely nothing calling out for help. You need to stay here. At this point, I'm getting worried about her. She was acting completely out of character. 
Not to mention that at this time, she is eight months pregnant with our baby daughter. She then says, what if there is some child out there lost in the woods? I said, well, first off, I would be able to hear them too. Secondly, there are no kids around here for miles, and the odds of them being lost a hundred feet from our house that's lit up like a Christmas tree is nil. She then says, I know, but what if it's a kid? Before I could say anything else, she stands up and starts walking towards the stairs. I jumped up and grabbed her hand again and said, No, you're not. Get in the house. I don't know what's going on, but you need to go inside. She then complies and we both go inside. I didn't know what this was, but it freaked me out. A few months after this, just as it was getting dark outside, I heard the front door to our house open and I got up to investigate. We have autistic six-year-old twins, and we have the door set up so they can't open it without us there. So to hear this sound, it could only be my wife. What was weird was the fact that she usually doesn't go outside without saying something to me. I walked out front and saw my wife walking down our private road towards the drive on the side of our house. I asked her what she's doing, and she says she was sitting on the back patio and kept hearing a baby crying out in the woods. I said, seriously, and you just decided to walk off into the woods to investigate? She then looks out into the woods and says, see, there it is again. Again, I can't hear anything. But what I did notice is that it was completely silent out again. I told her just like before, the chances of a baby being out in the woods outside our house is slim and that she needed to get back in the house. She said, what if someone left their baby out there? I said, well, if that were true, I would hear it too. Now at this point, I was really starting to worry about my wife's mental health. I actually asked her to see a psychiatrist and she did. Now looking back, I feel really bad about this knowing what I know. The key to this moment was that my wife had just given birth to a baby girl a month before. A few days after this, we're out on the front porch. It's early evening, and I had just mowed the lawn that day, and our three-year-old son was riding around on his little car in front of the house. Now, he knows that he's not allowed to go outside of a certain area that we've mapped off. He loves playing outside, but with the road behind 50 feet from our front porch, we have to be careful as a lot of boaters will fly through after drinking all day on their boats. As we're talking, we are both keeping an eye on him. A neighbor drives by and stops to say hi for a second. This interaction took approximately eight seconds. As all they said was, how are things? We said good. And he told us he would stop by later as his wife got something for the kids, who happens to be one of their teachers in school. And we said, okay, great. And he drove off. I looked over where our son was and he was gone. I called out his name and ran over to the side of the house and could hear his car on our side drive. I scolded him for leaving the area, and he said something in his three-year-old gibberish and pointed to the woods behind our house. I said he had five seconds to get back up to that porch or else, and he adamantly pointed back at the direction of the woods and kept trying to tell me something. I looked off in the direction of the woods and just assumed he saw a deer or squirrel or something and wanted to see it up close. I walked him back up to the front of the porch, and he cried the whole way there. He got really upset that I wouldn't let him go into the woods, but I just wrote this off as him being curious as most three-year-old boys are. Now, this incident isn't isolated as our twins have done similar things, but nothing quite as extreme as this. There have been nights where we had just laid down for the night and heard a loud bang on the side of our house on the wall behind our bed. It was so loud that I jumped up and looked out the window. Our floodlight had come on, but I couldn't see anything. Now, the weird part about this is that our bedroom sits about 12 feet from the ground level, as we have a full-size basement that's a cinder block. I put on my slippers and grabbed one of the 12-gauge shotguns and walked outside to investigate. It was dead silent again. The floodlight that's on the side of the house had clicked off at this point, so I walked over to the end of the deck and shined my light around the yard. There was nothing. I walked around the house and shined the light around intently. As I approached the back side of my house, the hairs on the back of my neck stood up. It felt like someone was watching me. I shined my light up in the trees again, but nothing. I rounded the corner, and the first thing I noticed was that my three dogs that were in their area wouldn't make a peep. Now our dogs have no filter, and will bark at anyone and everyone. This includes me. 
So to see them hiding with their tails between their legs, not making a peep, really had me worried. As I kept walking, all of a sudden the crickets and frogs started making sounds again. It was as if someone had clicked a switch. I walked back into the house and told my wife that I hadn't seen anything. She shrugged and said, okay, as long as our dogs were okay. Due to the circumstances that night, I decided to let the dogs in and sleep with us. This very same thing has happened on all four exterior walls of our house. It's random and annoying, but just like this instance, every time there is nothing going on outside. There have also been times where we were sitting in the house, and as I was watching a movie, my wife walked over to me and said, Did you call me? I said no, and she said that she swears she heard me call her name in her ear. She said that it was definitely my voice, but she didn't understand because it sounded so close, and I was a good 20 feet away from her in my recliner. The important part to this was that she was sitting at the table doing something, and the slider to the backyard was open behind her. Now our back patio sits about 20 feet off the ground, and is like a balcony, as it has no stair access outside. I think the previous owner built it for barbecuing. There have been several instances where she would say she heard someone whisper in her ear, but she couldn't make out the sound. Again, I kept thinking she was going crazy. But as you'll see, I think all of this is tied into this final moment where things are revealed. The last thing I want to mention before we get into what just happened is that I have a shooting range built behind my workshop on the opposite side of our property next to the main road. It's kind of on a downslope, but it works perfectly for what I need it for. The range itself is cut straight into the woods going down about 100 yards or so. When you're at the down range, you have woods surrounding you on all sides, except back up to my shop. I have to say, it's always felt creepy when I'm dealing with my targets or mowing. When you're down there, it feels like you're miles from anyone. One day, around 5 in the evening, I was sighting in a new rifle scope. The sun was still up, but was going to start to fade soon, so I knew I was going to be doing my final test. Up until this point, nothing really happened while I was making my multiple trips down range, other than this feeling of uneasiness. As soon as I got down range, I kept getting this feeling like someone or something was watching me. I looked around but didn't see anything. As I was placing stickers over my previous shots, I heard something big off to the side of me. It sounded like a large branch had snapped off a tree. Now, if you've been in Tennessee woods, you'll know a lot of branches fall off of trees randomly out of nowhere, so this is nothing new. Except this time, it was very loud, and sounded like fresh, strong wood, if that makes any sense. I turned and looked, but again couldn't see anything. I started walking back up to my rifle, and I swear I heard someone right behind me. I turned around, but again saw nothing. As I started to walk again, I heard this deep growl. It was really deep and loud, and what's worse is that it was all around me. I turned around facing the range and started walking backwards. The thought of some rabid dog charging out of the bushes had me freaked out, so running wasn't a good idea. I slowly walked backwards up the hill to my rifle but nothing happened. I grabbed my rifle and sprayed the target with rapid fire, hoping to scare off whatever was stalking me. I left 10 rounds in the mag and grabbed my rifle bag and quickly walked back up to the house. I never told my wife about this as I didn't want to freak her out. Fast forward about a year later from when we moved in and my niece is staying with us as a live-in nanny to earn money over summer break from college. We were on our way back from the store and about a mile from our house, I saw two big eyes reflecting in the headlights coming from a wide tree on the side of the road just ahead. It had caught my attention because they were higher than a deer, but a different color and size. Just as I had said, what is that, and squinted, they vanished. I had made a comment that it was almost as if I had known I could see its eyes move. The color was kind of a golden green but they resembled the mannerism of a large cat as they felt ominous. It's hard to explain, but I shrugged it off as we're passing the tree and saw nothing. A few moments later, we arrived at the house. As we were getting bags out of the car, my three-year-old son came bolting out of the house excited to see me. As I was waiting to help carry in her bags, I heard my dog growl. I looked in the direction she was looking at my neighbor's property across the street. 
Now what I saw has kept me up all night. Up until this point, I have always been skeptical, as I had never seen anything with my own two eyes. Even with what had happened to me a year prior, I still have my doubts that it was just my mind playing tricks on me. Now my street is kind of a spread out neighborhood. Each house sits on several acres, and at the end of our road is Kentucky Lake. My neighbor's house sits adjacent to my house on about an acre lot. Directly in front of my house is a wall of woods, and directly behind my house is several thousand acres of untouched forest. As I was looking across the street to my neighbor's property, I saw a large dark figure between the trees at first. The movement caught me off guard, as it looked like something big moving quickly on all fours. Then it came into clear view. It stood up and walked like a man. At first, I didn't know what to make of it. It was very tall, but what was strange about it was the distance it was covering, and the fact that when it was in front of its shed, I swear I could see through it. It was clearly walking, but moving faster than any person could at a sprint. More importantly, there was no sound. It was like it was phasing in and out of reality as it moved. I said, what the hell is that? And realized that it was looking directly at us. It had moved at an angle away from us to minimize its time out in the open, and moving quickly as it could, while still being silent. The hairs on the back of my neck stood up as I realized that whatever it was was stalking us. I told my niece to get in the house now, and I grabbed my son and booked it inside. I grabbed my AR-15 with a short scope and came back outside to see my niece still grabbing stuff out of the car. Knowing I told her firmly and clearly to get in the house, her disregard to my command annoyed me. But still, I watched over her without saying a word. As she was slowly walking, she turned towards the woods across the street from my house and suddenly bolted for the house. She ran up the steps in a panicked state. I asked her what she saw and her face was pale as a ghost. She said, I heard something big in the woods walking loudly on the leaves and when I turned toward it, I heard a deep, guttural growl. I asked her why she didn't come when I told her and she said that she thought I was talking to my son. I told her what I had seen and she wanted to get a closer look to see if she could see something. I told her that it was not a good idea, but she went anyway. As she was walking down to the walkway, I heard the sound of dry leaves crunching in the woods across the street. I told her to stop and come take the flashlight. Now at this point, she is about six feet away from my wife's SUV. As she turned and started walking back to me, I caught a glimpse of something gray and hairy, bolt from behind the SUV across the street into the woods. My porch is a raised porch, and our SUV is about six and a half feet tall, and whatever this was, it cleared about 45 feet in what looked like a single jump. It moved like lightning. Whatever it was, it wanted my niece. It jumped behind the car out of my line of sight and was waiting for her. She still doubted my warnings and grabbed the flashlight and walked back towards the car. As she entered my driveway, she stopped dead in her tracks, leaned forward as if she could see something. I asked her what she saw. She turned and ran back up on the porch with a terrified look on her face, saying, nope, 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 over and over again. She said it was a figure hiding inside of a tree and that she saw its eyes. I asked her what they looked like, and all she could say was that they looked dull and red at first, but as she got closer, they looked dead. I said, what do you mean dead? And she said that there were pupils that looked like they were gray, like the way his eyes look when they go blind. She said it was really dark gray, and she swears she could see through it, almost like a dark cloud. She wanted to go down again and took a step down the stairs, and as she did, it revealed itself from the tree. I said, get inside, and I went in and locked the door. It looked like a tall, human-shaped being. It was really tall and looked ominous as hell. The next morning, we did a height comparison to the tree limb she saw it stand over, and it put its height around nine feet tall, and its eyes were about six inches apart. At this point, I don't know what this thing was. After doing some research, I think it was a Glimmerman slash crawler. I looked to see if there had been any other sightings in Benton County, but nothing. More importantly, I swear it would phase in and out almost like a shadow person, but bigger and more obvious. Now, I originally posted this on r slash Bigfoot, but
but after doing a bunch of research, I believe this belongs here. One of the things that makes this fit is that it can communicate telepathically. This explains why everyone was hearing something that nobody else could hear. Secondly, it has a playback-like communication. So when I heard a dog panting, it was probably one of my dogs that it had heard. My wife was actually hearing our son crying for help, as he had recently fell and cried for help. The baby crying would be our newborn baby who she had given birth to recently. And it must have heard me call my wife's name and kept telepathically calling my wife's name with my voice. Another thing that my niece had said that night was that she felt compelled to go back outside to it. She said she felt like this thing was communicating with her somehow, and it wanted her to go back outside. The more I read about this thing, the more everything that's been happening over the past year makes sense. One thing that I find extra convincing is that down the road towards the lake, there is a property that is barbed wired off, and it's a wall of forest with no driveway. A lot of property down our road is underdeveloped, own land, and on one of the trees, there is a large old sign that says, Screamer lives here, with an arrow pointing back into the woods. Now I have to admit, when I first saw this sign, I laughed, thinking maybe the owner screamed at trespassers who entered his property, and teenagers put up the sign to mess with him. But when I did a satellite search of our neighborhood, that entire section of road has no houses or trails or anything, and is just pure forest as far as the eyes can see. One of the things that this thing is said to do is make a loud scream when threatened. Now that you understand my story, I doubt this is the ending. The next question is what can we do? I don't want my wife or kids to disappear one day. And if there is more than one of these things out there, this really makes the missing 411 make a whole lot of sense. I feel perplexed and scared as to what can I do? Any advice? I will try and keep this post alive with any new experiences. So I dated someone who owned a cadaver dog. Basically, they can find dead bodies. It was a new term to me when I met them. Anyways, they explained that they work with rescue teams. We live in wilderness country. The dog's job was to sniff out bodies for people who might have gotten lost and died, buried under avalanches, etc. After five months of dating, my now ex asked if I could house slash dog set. I was more than happy to. It was a great dog. Would be dog setting for two weeks while they visited family. I was warned that it has happened on hikes before that the dog picks up on the scent of a corpse, and I was given the steps to follow if it happens. First couple of days were pretty uneventful. Then one day, the dog is dragging me down this trail, and I'm panicking because I was like, oh shoot, am I going to see a dead body? But the dog stops at this very stern woman, just sauntering along. She keeps looking back and forth between me and the woman. She gives me a quick, your dog isn't well trained, and keeps going. I had to drag him away. It happens with this same woman a few more times. So I call the owner to bring it up. I describe the woman and my ex is so shocked and confused, not familiar with the woman. Fast forward to my last night dog setting. I was going to bed and had this horrific nightmare of being held down in bed by the woman. I hear a bark and wake up. The dog is standing next to me on the bed in its alert position staring at the bed. I didn't get any sleep and I never got an answer. I lived in Columbia, South Carolina, and frequented Congergy National Park, so I'm familiar with the area. I often would jump the fence and walk the boardwalk at night, and it's super peaceful to walk the swamp and hear all the wildlife. They never have a ranger or guard there after hours, so I was always alone. The last time I did this was in October of 2021. I was taking my usual stroll with flashlight in hand. I should mention, between the insects and frogs, the sound is loud. But then, it completely stopped when I was about a mile in. I heard what I thought was my wife call me from the trailhead, but she wasn't there. 
I was alone and she was out of town. I then heard water sloshing to my right and saw nothing with my flashlight. I chalked it up as being tired and kept moving. The wildlife started up shortly after and everything was fine. Maybe 15 minutes later, I noticed it got eerily quiet again and heard swamp water swashing on my left. But this time, it sounded more deliberate, like somebody walking. I was in a thick portion of the cypress and couldn't see more than 20 feet in front of me. And then I heard my wife's voice again. Again, she wasn't with me and was out of town, clearly not moving through a swamp at 1 a.m. I saw what looked like a human silhouette move between the trees for a split second, but it was off, very skinny, pale, and taller than me at six feet. I noped out of there and ran the almost two miles back to my truck and didn't slow down until I heard the wildlife again. Like I said, this is a boardwalk that's in a swamp in the boonies. Nobody's walking around in the water at night without a light, or ever, honestly. And I don't know of any animal that big that walks in bipedal pattern. And I've spent my life outdoors. I feel like I should add that I wasn't high or sleep deprived. I just like the woods at night. I was so freaked out by this that I came to Reddit and dove into some of the stories on this sub as well as others. I'm convinced I encountered a crawler or wendigo or something else that can mimic voices. There is no way some meth head was stumbling through the swamp miles from civilization that sounded exactly like my wife but then again it's also south carolina a few years ago in the northern parts of sweden i'm going out for a nice evening of fishing I am what I guess is called a fishing supervisor. I check that the other fishermen got their license at a certain area of lakes and streams. This is in late summer, and I've been doing my round, which I usually end with going to a small lake and fly fish for some trout. This lake or pond is pretty deep in the forest, and I rarely meet anyone there. Actually, I've never met anyone there. This lake looks kind of like a crater. A perfect round circle that's perhaps... 100 meters in diameter. It contains a natural population of perch and trout. It's a warm summer evening with a slight breeze. The birds are chirping and the fish are rising to all the insects spawning on the surface. I rig my gear and aim for one of the fish rising to the right of me. The same second as my fly lands on the surface, it's like someone pauses time. The sun hides behind a cloud. The wind stops blowing. The birds are suddenly silent, and the fish stop eating. A smell rises from the ground I'm standing on. It smells like something dead, something rotten, like I have a carcass buried under my feet. All of a sudden, I'm aware there is something walking out in the forest behind me, maybe 10 to 15 meters behind me. It's like I can see it in the corner of my eye, but still, I really can't see it. Every hair on my body is on its end and it's suddenly very cold around me. The thing watching me just stands there, and I don't have the courage to turn around at all. I see my fly sink to the bottom, but I can't move. I can't do anything about it because I don't dare move. Then the wind hits me, and it carries the awful smell away. The sun hits me again. A bird is singing somewhere in the forest, and the almost overtaking feeling of being watched lets go of me. I turn around, and there is nothing there. On the lake, the fish start rising again. I pack my gear and throw the backpack on my back and run for it. Through the forest, to my car. I hit the gas and drive like a maniac until I find the big road and civilization again. I park at the side of the road and say to myself, What was that? My heart is still racing. I haven't visited this lake since this happened. And I don't know anyone else who has either. What do you guys think it was? I've probably visited this place 20 times before this happened, and never felt anything like it. The only thing is that I'm always afraid of bears when visiting it. I do fish at a lot of ponds and lakes that's pretty deep in the forest. There's always a lot of wildlife in these places. Deer, moose, fox, and the occasional wolf, bobcat, and bear. 
I'm never afraid of meeting one, except when I've been visiting this particular lake. Sorry for bad English, as you probably understand in the beginning. I'm from Sweden. After reading a few posts on here, I've decided to add one of the creepier, still unexplained events that happened to me and a group of friends within the past five years. Thinking back on it, I still get this unnerved bad feeling that just sort of lingers. Anyways, here it goes. A group of friends and myself rented a place on a lake for just a fun-filled, drunken weekend. We were all in our young to mid-twenties, and it was supposed to be a big party. For the most part, that's what it was. The Friday night and Saturday morning, we pretty much went out having a blast on the water and just doing fun, stupid stuff. Well, naturally, when Saturday afternoon rolled around, we were all so dead from going out that we all decided it would be a a night of no drinking. Maybe a little weed smoking by some of us, but nothing more than that. And just kind of having a chill evening and night. That's what it was. Relaxed. So 9 p.m. comes rolling around, and about eight of us were inside the house and five outside. The house was a two-story, with a second-story deck slash back porch, and it was surrounded by the woods, and then down through the woods, you would then hit the lake. I'll mention that we had already experienced some weird vibes from the locals when we first arrived in town, mostly just backcountry old-timers that I assumed were leering and irritated because we were a bunch of college-age kids looking to have a good time. But the town and the lake were large, so it's not like anyone knew where we were staying. Anyways, three of my friends were on the upstairs back porch, and my other friend and I were downstairs outside, just talking on this old table near the woods. I mean, it was otherwise just a really nice night. My friend and I were getting lost in conversation, and all of a sudden there was this weird feeling that encompassed us, like an unnerving physical presence that came from the woods behind us. It was so strong we both kind of quieted down, and then out of nowhere this loud chanting abruptly came from the woods. I have no idea how far away it was. Because of the way the lake is set up, I'm pretty sure the voices carried up through the forest. It sounded like a cult chanting away, and all of the voices were male. I mean, they were loud and perfectly in sync. I think we were silent for all of about 20 seconds before I couldn't contain myself and darted towards the house with her following me. I don't know how to explain the feeling that came with the chanting, but it was almost evil, like something so powerfully uninviting. I was shaking by the time that I got up to the second story and ran out the balcony with the other three friends. One of them, my brother. By the time we got up there, the chanting was gone, and I naturally asked, Did you guys hear that? In the most shaky, freaked out voice. They all had heard it, and not seconds later the chanting began again. So the five of us are out there peering into the forest, listening to this chanting that would sometimes sound far away, and then would sound relatively close. All male voices in the weirdest language, or I don't even know what it was, it sounded like a strange, extreme church. Then following the chanting, a loud bang like someone hit a huge metal object. And then the worst part came. A man wailing, like an extreme pain wailing. All of my hair was up. It was the freakiest experience ever. My brother and I were staring at each other in a mixture of scared excitement and horror. The wailing stopped, and then it was back to the chanting, which eventually died out. I was so freaked out by it, I wanted to call the cops, because whoever screamed had been in a lot of pain. That, mixed with the weird chanting just made me immediately think of some terrible sacrifice going on. One friend tried to say it had to be some drunk guys just messing around singing and being weird, but no way was that coming from some drunk guys. They were perfectly in sync. Then the bang, and then the well of pain. And then, all that weird tension and energy was just gone. No, I didn't call the cops, and I wish I would have. But honestly, the forest was so large, and since the lake house was up looking down at the woods and lake, it could have been anywhere. It definitely wasn't in our close proximity, but it was close enough to hear all of that perfectly. 
We went in and got some of the others, but by the time they came out, the chanting had stopped. Someone wanted to go explore and find out where it had been coming from, but obviously that was a stupid idea. After that, I was so ready to go home. I can't explain the relief of driving away from there the next morning. Even now, it gives me the worst feeling. Whatever that was, it felt so wrong and evil. I'll never forget that moment. I can only imagine that it was some weird cult stuff. So this experience that I had was really weird. I went out rock hounding solo today to a place my husband and I have gone before. Everything seemed normal when I arrived. It's a very secluded area of creek with a rock bar in the middle of the creek and with a small patch of woods to the left and a dense forest on the right. I crossed the creek and set up on my gear on the rock bar, grabbed a bag and started walking up the creek. About 45 minutes in, I kept looking up at the forest. I don't know why, but I just kept getting an eerie feeling. Every now and again, I'd hear a couple of thumps out there, but you know, nature, so I didn't think anything of it. About an hour in, I heard my first meow. I was so focused on pulling clay that I literally stood up and was like, I did not just hear a cat meow, did I? Ten minutes go by, and I'm walking further up creek, and damn it if I didn't hear it again. I stopped and was like, yep, I just heard a cat meow. How strange. But like, something seemed really off, and I started to feel uneasy. So I turned around and headed back to my site. Something about that meow wasn't right. It wasn't a painful meow, but just like a matter-of-fact meow, if that makes sense. About five minutes into the trek, I definitely hear a meow again, and I'm sweating like crazy because of the heat that instantly feel cold, clammy, and the hair is standing up on the back of my neck. I know what I was supposed to be hearing, a single meow, but it wasn't coming from a cat. It sounded like someone or something imitating a meow. I keep focused on getting back to my sight, and about five minutes later, another single meow. Here's where I realize things are getting really weird. The meow always sounded the same distance from me, no matter how far I kept walking. I finally reach my sight and pull out my drinks and plop down to rehydrate. That's when another meow sounded, and this time, I knew with everything in me, that that was not a cat following me. I calmly gathered up my gear and started a trek across the creek to the path to my car and another meow. I made my way across the creek and hunched down into a pit. I parked my car right next to the edge of the forest and was really starting to lose my stuff. I get my keys and mace out and put my gear on me so I can drive into my car and rearrange later. And that's exactly what I did and I hightailed it out of there fast. Thoughts? The rational answer is someone was screwing with me. But how did they get back there? It's like 200 acres of forest. Also, edit to add, I'm in northern Alabama. This occurred around 1999 or 2000. My best friend and I were avid outdoor adventurers and amateur pot growers. We would frequently find secluded places in the woods that allowed for ample light and shade for plants to grow and that would not allow them to be easily found. One particular day, we went to an annex of trails located near a New Jersey State Park trail system. The trails weren't in the park, but I had hiked them before and knew they weren't that frequented. We had gone out that day with our seeds, partially sprouted in moist paper towels. We parked the car at the trailhead and started hiking in. We covered a mile or so and then ventured off the trail into the woods. We found a clearing, planted seeds, and tied a few barely visible ribbons off to mark the way to the plant spot to check them in the future. My friend and I got back on the trail and started walking back to the car, when my friend noticed a man in the other direction just staring at us. He was probably in his 30s or 40s, bald head. 
normal clothes. We didn't think anything of it for the most part, but we definitely kept looking back as anyone would when someone is behind them in the woods. We saw that he was walking 60 plus or so feet behind us. It seemed weird, but it was probably more so to us having anxiety that we planted seeds. We picked up the pace, but the man also seemed to pick up the pace as we weren't gaining any distance. At one point, we decided to just get off the trail and let him pass. We turned off the trail and walked into a thicket of stickier bushes, which I remember vividly getting shredded on. We got deep into the woods and heard cursing. When we turned around, the man was coming through where we entered. It was at that moment we actually became scared. Mind you, we're two young, strong 19-year-olds, but a man following you in the woods is pretty creepy. We made a U maneuver to outflank him and came out of the woods a bit further down trail. Once we were back on the trail, we ran. As we were running, there was a fork in the trail and my friend went right and I left. I realized my mistake as my buddy was going down the correct path and I wasn't. So I turned around and started running back towards the fork to follow my friend. As I was running towards the direction we came from, to get to the fork, I could see the man running towards me down the trail. He was a distance away, but not far enough in my eyes. Survival mode kicked in and I ran as hard as I could. I caught up to my friend who was walking at that point. I screamed he's after us and we both booked it all the way back to the car. We got in the car shaking it out of breath. We backed up and started to get out of the parking lot when the man appeared on the trailhead. He stopped there and just stared at us as we drove away. I always wonder what that was all about. Did he want to kill a couple of 19 year olds? Was he also doing something illegal in those woods and wanted us gone? <laughs> My buddy and I still laugh and talk about that day 22 years ago. I'm posting this for my boyfriend who doesn't have Reddit. Last weekend, he went up on a two mile hike into a small creek to fish in North Carolina. On his way up the mountain, he kept thinking that he saw things in his peripheral vision, looking backwards to see shadowy dark crags and rocks or a shadow falling along the tree bark. The mountain air was crisp and refreshing, at an altitude of over 2,000 feet. Yet, whenever he felt this weird presence, he described smelling something like a propane tank up his nostrils, sulfur, and damp stickiness. There was no explanation or reason to smell that in this place. He had visited many times before and never smelled this in the area. The whole way up, the unsettling feeling of being watched maintained, and he just kept chanting, God is with me, I fear no evil. God is with me, I fear no evil. Over and over. He swore to me that he felt like something was following him all the way up, maybe too scared to get close, and that he now thought he knew what a demon smelled like. He made it to his fishing spot and returning down the mountain, again saw the unmistakable shadowy movement out of the corner of his eye blend back into the trees behind him. Has anyone ever been alone in the woods and smelt that same smell or felt any kind of presence like this? I know there's a lot of folklore around the Appalachian Mountains about haints and things of that sort. I think he wants to figure out what it means and know if he's alone in this experience. The place was called Panther Town Creek. So I live in a cul-de-sac in a suburban neighborhood with a medium-sized wooded area behind my house. My bedroom is literally next to my back sliding glass door, and every night I can hear something large moving around back there. All of my cats and dogs are inside, so I know it's not them. It'll be slowly moving around back there and then stop. I'll say something loudly and then it'll start up again. Sometimes it'll even move faster, which will make me go back inside. I don't believe it's a wolf because I've only had one encounter with one in my 12 years of living here. Usually I'll hear the wolves howling at night, but they're always far away. I've been back in those woods during the day and I've saw nothing, not even a snake. It only happens in the dead of night. There's a legendary Bigfoot-like creature known as the Flintville Monster that's been spotted 
since it was seen and shot by several cops in the 1970s, but that community is several miles away. I just don't know what it could be. My family and I went on a trip to the Hawking Hills area of southern Ohio a few weeks ago. There was a place that I always wanted to visit, the abandoned ghost town of Moonville Rail Tunnel. I have never been to this area, so I don't know what to expect. But I did know that it was pretty deep in the woods. We took a trip from our rented cabin using Google for GPS to the location. We start driving, and it's, for lack of better words, real impoverished where we were driving. Slash, hills have eyes ass. We literally only see a few cars on the way there, and are on back roads. We get to a point where we need to enter into a forest, and we're close to the tunnel. There was a sign that said we were entering Bubba Wood. For a little additional information, I have a Mercedes that I am just lucky to have, and have my husband in the car, a black man with dreadlocks, my 10-year-old, non-verbal autistic son, and my 6-year-old daughter. We drive down this real creepy stone road into the forest, and there's nothing back there. No houses, no cars, nobody. We see signs that we're close and pull in the parking lot. There's a footbridge with a ton of stuff on it that people put there. We walk over the footbridge and make our way towards the tunnel, which is a lot larger than I expected. We hear this sound coming from the other side of the tunnel that goes into the woods away from the parking lot. A truck comes driving through the tunnel towards us while we are on foot. He gets out of his truck with a chainsaw, and it's a white guy in his 60s. He walks with my entire family everywhere we go, and through the tunnel. I tried to make small talk with him and pull some info about if he worked for the Department of Natural Resources, etc. He really wasn't budging. We turn around and walk out of the tunnel, and he starts using a chainsaw behind us, and the sound is just echoing through this tunnel. At this point, we have no cell phone service and literally no one knows my family is out there except for us. I was already worried my car was sending the wrong idea to people, like we have money or something. We don't. We rush to the car to get the kids in their booster seats, and this dude comes driving over the footbridge in his truck towards us in the parking lot. I honestly don't even know how his truck fit on it. He stops again and gets out of his truck and starts walking the other direction, much to our relief. About this time, I noticed there are dusty handprints on my car. I asked my husband if they were his, and we compared his hand and my son's, and they were not a match. I don't know who could have touched the car because we were with the chainsaw man the entire time we were there. We get out of there as fast as possible. Just a few minutes later, I look in my rearview mirror, and there's a bunch of dust kicked up behind us, and there he is. He had to have driven pretty fast on the stone road to catch up to us like that. There is nowhere to go in the woods. The road is basically one lane, and we have no cell service or GPS. Every time I think we lose him, he is there again. I'm waiting for my tires to get popped, or something, or for this guy to ram me off the road into a ravine in the woods. Finally, we get out of this woods, and I turn out and he's still following. We were following printed directions to get back, and I ended up making a wrong turn in the excitement. The guy in the truck was finally gone, and I turned around to go back past the stone road that goes into the forest. There is one lone house near this road, and there is his truck, parked there. He had to have seen us drive onto this road into the woods, and taken some back way to the tunnel. I don't know if he was just trying to protect the site from more graffiti or what, but he really creeped us out. It was like every scary movie trope rolled into one single event. Me and my best friend were walking to the park. It was getting dark. My boyfriend wasn't far behind and was just finishing his pint at the pub. It wasn't dark when we set off, but it was getting dark by the time we reached the entrance to the park. Our plan was to just sit down and chill. Anyway, we heard a voice. I didn't respond to it, but I asked Josh, Are they saying my dead name? 
He said it sounded like Nessa, not Vanessa, which is weird because we may have heard two different things. Josh called me Nessa right up until I came out and he found a new nickname for me. Everyone else called me Vanessa. I was distinctly creeped out by the voice and so was Josh. We waited for my boyfriend to arrive and sat down at the entrance to the park but didn't go in. That was enough outdoors for me. We walked Josh home then went home ourselves. What am I to make of this? Edit. I was posting something about the government and how awful what is happening is, and behind me was a clapping noise. Every time I looked away from behind me, it stopped. I watched behind, and it continued, but I saw nothing there. It again sounded mocking, like the voice in the woods. I once saw a shape-shifting type cryptoid creature when I was about 12 years old in Shasta County. I found it most correlated with the description of a Wendigo or Skinwalker. It followed my family vehicle home from the wooded area near the Shasta College. I first noticed this thing jumping from tree to tree in pursuit of our truck heading down Old Oregon Trail. At some point, it vanished from sight, and later that night, I went out back to find my mother so I could ask something, and that's when I heard it. I had put on a sort of off-putting voice of my mother that I didn't quite trust and felt chills when hearing it. Yet, it lured me into my backyard saying, I'd say, Mom, is that you? No reply. I figured she was trying to show me something out there, so I walked down my porch stairs and asked, Mom, is that you? Again, I hear, in a bone-chilling manner that did sound like my mother. This gave me chills to my core. Then, upon seeing it up close, I realized it was not my mother at all, and kind of looked as if it was trying to take on my look, but was much lengthier, and had very pale, tight skin, and deep black sunken in eyes. Later on, my mother would tell me that she heard it too, before she left, to go to the store. It's been happening for about two months now, but every time I'm outside alone, day or night, I hear someone calling my name, like long and drawn out, almost sing-song, like... Amanda. It's not the same voice every time, but it does sound like a relative each time. I have none that live close to me. I was outside putting things in my car one morning, and in a thicket behind me, I heard huge branches snapping and a lot of commotion among the leaves. But as soon as I turned towards the noise, it was dead silent. I've only heard a little bit about them. So, I don't know if I'm just imagining things or what, but I believe it could be a skinwalker. Can anyone give me more info on them, or any insight as to what this might be? I do live in the Appalachia area as well. Edit. To add. I'm currently taking advantage of the mental health resources in my area, and I do not have any hallucinogenic conditions. I do not have schizophrenia. Thank you, though, for your comments. Another edit to clarify. The branch snapping sound sounded like something falling out of a tree because of a snapped limb, not just something walking that snapped it. It was about 8.30 p.m., while taking out the trash at work with a co-worker slash roommate, a large dog approached us. It seemed to be galloping. It wasn't walking normally, like an animal should. Despite the many surrounding lights, the dog appeared to be entirely black. It was silhouetted just enough that you could see its muscle definition. I could see a slight reflection in its eyes. 
it seemed to lack a shadow. My roommate and I both expressed having different experiences and visions of the dog. When I initially saw the dog, I interacted saying, Aw, a dog, in excitement. For me, it proceeded to sit entirely still on the cement, staring like a statue. What I saw was a large, fluffy black dog, lazy ears, similar to a Newfoundland dog. My roommate expresses seeing the dog as a large, very muscular, aggressive-looking black dog that stood rigid the entire time, staring like it wanted to attack. It was short-haired, muscled, and had pointed ears. I jokingly stated that the dog looked like a skinwalker, not really anticipating that anything would happen. Then we both immediately felt a wake of dread fall over us. Something was wrong. We both saw the dog's jaw open, almost as if it was about to bark. We heard a distant, yet extremely clear, high-pitched, Come here. The dog immediately turned to take off. We turned around the corner. The creature was unreasonably far up the road for a short amount of time that it was not being observed. It was wobbling, crossing its paws, walking oddly. When it turned left around a corner, it seemed to nearly stand up on its hind paws, walking on two legs, just before passing around out of sight. The rest of the night was just as interesting. We had trouble with certain objects slightly moving places, nudging a bit, settling. It quickly became more aggressive, but then, just as we were about to leave, we heard a loud and persistent knocking coming from the front of the store. We quickly went to our cars. On the drive home, I tried to blast music and ignore what I had just seen. I heard whispering coming from my back seat. I couldn't quite make out any words. It just sounded like whistling, almost. But get this. I saw a random, antique, clawfoot bathtub on the left side of the road, in a field. It was certainly not there the day before, or even that morning on my drive there. The kicker, I was watching the sidelines of the roads for animals, and I most certainly saw a buck. He was leaping out in front of the road, a good 50 feet ahead. I slammed on my brakes, but when I got closer, it was merely a bush. Perhaps I was just paranoid, but this is all very concerning so I had an incident around 12 years ago it was with an old buddy of mine and his old community the community I believe was an Indian reservation it was nighttime and we went for a walk down a dirt road the whole community was a trailer park home area, except for a few houses there. As we walked down the road, we came near this one house with an outside light on that had chickens and dogs. Mind you, my buddy knew this area pretty well. As we were walking, we heard the dogs making weird noises. After we heard the noise, my buddy looked at me and told me to run back to his house. So of course, I ran with him. As we were running, I stopped running out of shock from what I saw right in front of me. It was a dark, cloaked figure with long black hair. A mask like a samurai face. You know, those masks that have the long teeth sticking out of the mouth, but it was an actual face. Staring right at me. I was so scared I couldn't move. This lasted five seconds, and then it floated into the woods. Yes, it wasn't standing on the ground. It was floating. I remember this event with every small detail after all these years. No, I wasn't high on anything, nor was I drunk. I was completely sober and terrified. If anyone has any idea on what I saw that night, I would really appreciate it. Please don't comment if you're going to be messed up. I'm very serious about this and I'm just looking for answers. Thank you in advance. My sister and I jokingly looked for paranormal creatures and such. I know you're not supposed to do that kind of stuff, but we didn't actually think they were real. Or at least, 
not able to actually hurt anybody or take on a physical form, just give off energy. We were camping in the woods of Colorado, a decent distance from any pretty big town or anything. Day one, we left our campsite as soon as the sun set and walked around the lake surrounded by forestry. We were joking around and laughing about the whole thing. Once we got over to the small bridge, however, we got a lot more anxious. We walked by this information sign. Then, in the trees, there was this tall, skinny, white, human-like figure. When I flashed my light on it, the thing was apparently tree branches, but the shape completely changed. We ran away from there and felt a bad energy following us the whole time. We felt it more in certain places, and felt it less in others. My sister claimed to have seen one more creature at the top of the hill, but I didn't see it. We were walking for a while, and nothing else super notable happened other than the negative energy, weird smells, and a few odd noises. My sister kept smelling rotting meat, but I didn't smell it despite being right next to her. The odd noises were really just things like footsteps and twigs crackling, but we did hear an off dog growl and a lot of coyote howls. We got back to camp and went to bed like normal. I'd like to note that we heard an owl all night, which may be important. Day two, we went again, but this walk was much shorter. We went to the same place we saw the creature last time, but were too scared to go past the information sign. We heard an owl again and saw it right there on top of a tree. I don't know if this owl means anything, but my sister said it was acting strange and that we should leave. We left and decided to go straight to the campsite. While we were walking, my sister claimed to have seen some weird coyote and was laser focused on it. I didn't see it. She then started running and told me to run too. I was confused because I really didn't see anything, but she was white as a ghost and claimed it changed to a humanoid form. When we got back to camp, I could feel something was in the forest behind us. As soon as we got there, we got silent lightning too. My dad's friend was camping with us and told us that she said something to keep skinwalkers away. She's native, like actually native, so we trusted it a lot and felt a relief from the negative energy that we were feeling. When I was in seventh grade, my sister and I went to the woods next to our school to explore. The woods are thick, but it's a relatively small patch. About five minutes into the walk, we felt a change, like we were being watched or almost like we were dreaming. At that moment, a large deer, a buck with enormous antlers stood up. The deer stands there about 10 feet from us, doesn't panic or scare, just stands there. And as it did, the world felt like it stopped. And at that time, I felt like I was being spoken to, a form of communication without words, but it was a connection that I've never felt before. That feeling lasted for a minute, then faded. Then, the deer turned and calmly walked away, disappearing under the brush. Me and my sister only told our parents we saw a deer, never said about how close or the strange occurrences that came with it. I never told anyone that I felt like a deer or creature spoke to me. Now, 20 years later, I retold this story with some family and my sister present. As I told the story up to when the deer looked at us, my sister cut in to say, and I swear that deer had unnatural antlers, and I swear to God, it spoke to me. We freaked out, because we never spoke of it talking. So now I'm looking for answers. Some friends told me that it could be a skinwalker, but I'm not sure. We didn't get any evil or negative feelings from this. If anyone knows of anything, I would love to hear it. The location was in Michigan, in the United States of America. I'm not that great of a storyteller, but I'll just quickly write what happened. 
We were staying at a Hogan Airbnb on the Navajo Nation close to Monument Valley, and there were several very friendly calm dogs roaming around. I and my friends, one of whom is deathly afraid of dogs, had no problem being with them or petting them. We had a gorgeous view of Monument Valley right from our door, and it was cold yet cozy. That night, I needed to use the bathroom and open the door to the dogs going absolutely nuts. There's a difference between a dog barking at just whatever, a person walking by, for example, and then there was this, total fight-or-flight response. One of the dogs ran up to me looking anxious and glanced into the desert behind the Hogan. It became close, then walked back to look into the desert behind the Hogan. Its fur stood up, and it suddenly looked more like a wolf and took off into the desert at full speed, growling and barking at a huge shadow that ran away from the dog. There aren't many huge animals in the area. Some deer and horses, maybe cattle, but this was bigger. I didn't stick around long enough to check what it was. I was pretty shaken by what I saw. Found some fresh wolf slash mountain lion prints and hoof prints, probably from a horse, outside the Hogan the next morning. The dog's prints are smaller, our host said that we might have seen a skinwalker. I'd like to believe it was a horse. It was dark anyhow, but the host didn't want to talk much about it. The guides we met later on said the same thing and kept it at that. Later that day, one friend suddenly fell ill on a tour of another Hogan and almost fainted. That never happened before in her life. The guide said that she probably had some bad spirits attached to her. She recovered quickly after stepping outside. That's all. It was a really wonderful trip overall, and I'd go again if I could. I grew up in a very small Kansas town on the Nebraska border, a relatively quiet place. I usually went on a walk with my very small dog around dusk or dark. Besides the rabbit or occasional skunk, we never really saw anything in town. It was starting to get dark when my dog and I walked up to the park. There was a row of bushes where we had a family cat buried when he passed. I just glanced up to that spot when I saw something hunched over at its grave. It looked like it was looking for something. It was on four paws and had skin that seemed to be a sickly grayish tint with patches of scraggly fur. The face looked vaguely dog-like. It looked really lean. I was frozen in place because I wasn't sure what I was seeing and how it would react when it saw me. But when it saw me, it looked me dead in the eye and ran off on two feet. I thought I was hallucinating or crazy, but my dog reacted to the same thing. She didn't bark, but she was terrified and stayed really close to my side. We rushed inside and I've never seen that thing again. Happened over 10 years ago, but I still wonder what I saw. I know I don't live in Navajo area, so I have my doubts that it was a skinwalker. I'm just not quite sure what else it could have been. This experience I'm going to describe has taken a while for me to get together and actually write down. I have experienced a few paranormal things, but this is the craziest one of all of them. It takes place in Yosemite National Park in August of 2017 with my two best friends, Zach and Andrew. Zach had worked that summer as a parking agent at Glacier Point and was pretty familiar with the area. His employee housing he was given was a house in Wawona with two other guys. Andrew and I were visiting for the week and had each been to Yosemite before. One of the nights there, we decided to watch the sunset over Chilnawalna Falls. It was a great hike that Zach had done before. The trail was about four miles to the top, with about a 2,000 foot elevation gain. We brought food and decided to hike up and take a swim, and eat at the pools on top of the falls. We set out a couple of hours before sunset. As we approached the top portion, we were about a half mile to the top of the falls where a guy about our age, early 20s, ran up to us from bushes, frantically asking for help. His friend had fallen 50 feet off a cliff and had a shattered femur. Zach was used to this. After working in the park all summer, he had seen many injuries and was used to it. 
The man didn't have cell reception, but I did. So I called 911 and reported the accident, requesting search and rescue. After a few minutes, we decided we wanted to continue the hike after search and rescue assured us that they would be there soon with a helicopter. We told the guy help was on its way, and we continued the next half mile up to the top of the falls. When we got there, it was a picture-perfect scene. A beautiful sunset as we swam and ate. We then got an amazing show as we saw the helicopter land to pick up the injured guy we just encountered right below us. I'm a private pilot and Air Force aviator, so I loved every second of watching the helicopter land on the mountainside. After the sunset, we began the hike down and passed the spot with the injured guy and search and rescue was taking care of him. We had a brief encounter with them. They thanked us for calling in. It was now dark out and we continued the hike down. There wasn't much moonlight. It was pretty dark, so we used our phones as flashlights to see the trail. This is where the story gets interesting. The top of the hike was switchbacks with a steep incline on the right and a steep decline on the left with shrubs and trees. It was definitely too steep to hike down, hence the switchbacks. About one mile into the hike down, Zach was in front with a light. I was second also shining my light, and Andrew was in the back. Zach was shining his light ahead and saw something sticking out from behind a tree that was about 15 feet ahead, just off the right to the path, and instinctively, he shined the light at it. That's when whatever it was exposed itself from the tree and ran across the path, down to the left and down the steep grade. It ran on two feet and resembled some sort of humanoid. It was a little shorter than us and very clearly had two arms and legs, but it moved in an inhuman way. It kind of resembled a person, It had a head and its limbs, but appeared to be just skin, no clothes on at all. We all three saw it and stopped dead in our tracks. We continued shining the light to where it ran, down the left side of the mountain, but didn't see anything after it ran down. We were absolutely terrified, none of us really knowing what to say because we had no idea what we saw. The worst part was that we had another three mile hike down, and mile and a half from the trailhead to Zach's house all while knowing that this creature could be stalking us and was near. Luckily, we made it to his house, terrified and exhausted, but without harm. Whatever it was must have just been as scared as we were at it. My question is if anyone else has had similar experiences in that area. I've done some research, and my best guess would be a skinwalker, but it didn't try to lure us into the forest with it. We had a subsequent experience a couple years later, in Tioga Pass, right outside of the Tioga Gate of the Park. We were camping in a closed campground in Tioga. In the middle of the night, I woke up to take a pee. And after exiting the tent, I saw an orb about five feet from the tent, floating across with a bright light. I don't think it was a person, because Zach, Andrew, and I all saw the orb floating across, and there wasn't anyone around us. Our friend Jackson was also in the tent, and in the morning told us he felt rocks getting thrown at the tent all night along with hearing footsteps near all night. Does anyone have similar experiences? I'd love to hear them. We all know what we saw, and we know that it was not human. I was on my way to go camping and had just crossed the Mackinac Bridge to get to Michigan's Upper Peninsula. It was storming, and just started pouring buckets of rain. While driving up a hill, my daughter and I saw a man standing in the middle of the road. There was not great visibility with the sheets of rain, but we both pointed out the man standing in the middle of the road, and we were worried he could get hit by a car. When he turned around, it was not a man. It was a huge black dog. We both thought it was a man at first, and then it was a dog, and I can't explain it could have just been the combination of looking up from the bottom of a hill in the rain. I think it is odd, though, that my daughter and I both thought that we saw a man. I stopped on one side of the road to help it, and so did a man on the other side in a truck. I love dogs and always stop to help when I see one on the road, but I hoped that someone else would be able to help it because my truck was stuffed with camping stuff, and the only place it could go in my truck would be the front seat with my daughter and I. It was still in the middle of the road, looking back and forth between the man and I. Seeing it up close, I was a bit surprised to see how big it was. I also felt uneasy and intimidated by this animal. 
It looked almost like a black German shepherd, but also wolfish. I was a dog grimmer, so I've been around a lot of big dogs, and this one was huge. And if I had to guess what breed, I would say a wolf hybrid. The guy yelled over asking if it was my dog, and I yelled back no. The man then yelled, here boy, and patted his leg, and the dog ran off to him. Seeing the dog was being taken care of, I got back in my truck and got back on the road towards our camping destination. My daughter was telling me how it looked like a person standing in the road, and then when it turned, it was a dog. It may not be paranormal, but it was definitely an interesting experience. I've heard of this sort of thing, but only briefly. I've never really thought much of it, nor have I ever done any reasonable research into this. I figured this might be a good place to start. I'm cross-posting my story from the r slash dogman sub. This is a really odd story of how I came to see a literal dogman last night, around midnight. I live in a neighborhood, by the way, but we're on the edge of a large forest behind our house, so it's not completely rural funny part of the story so i set a live trap for a mouse last night catch and release i can't stand to harm mice it triggered at midnight and the loud pop of the door woke me up i decided i didn't want to just leave it in the cage all night long waiting for morning i could hear him trying to chew through the wires and didn't want him to torture himself or get hurt attempting to get out so i decided i'd just take him outside immediately Instead of releasing mice in the yard by my house, I always go about three miles away into a forested area. I'm not cruel enough to just release them by someone else's house, thus causing them a mouse problem. Irrelevant info, I know. Anyway, before I got in my car to transport the little mouse, my stomach began hurting like never before. It was a horrible, foreboding feeling that was almost telling me something terrible was about to happen. There was no reason for my stomach to suddenly just start screaming in pain. I essentially never have stomach problems like this. It's exceedingly rare. I just don't get stomach aches. But this was painful on a scale that was so strange. I kept getting this deep sense of something being wrong. I got into the car with the little cage. Going down the street, it was literally only one block away from my home that I instantly slowed on the brakes because of something enormous at the side of the road. At first I thought, well... That has got to be the tallest dog I've ever seen. Its silhouette was blacker than the night. As I slowed my car from maybe 20 miles an hour to 10, it suddenly came out into the streetlight and walked across the street in front of my car. It wasn't running, but it wasn't going slow either. I suddenly realized it was no ordinary dog, but I knew it wasn't a bear either because it didn't have much of a belly. This was three to four times the size of a wolf, And so, I can confirm it was not a wolf. What I saw looked like a humanoid literally hunched over on all fours. Back erect in a hunch. Moving with pace across the road. The head was distinctly wolf-like and enormous. Literally looked like a giant wolf head. The being had jet black fur. As black as hair can get. The legs were lanky. My brain literally froze. Instantly, I began rationalizing, but it was fairly impossible to rationalize what I had just seen. The closest thing I can compare this to would be the werewolf from Harry Potter that Professor Lupin turns into. All I can think of is, how did they know? That's nearly identical to what this thing looks like as it's hunched over and walking on all fours. It's horrifying. It was literally quite accurate to looking at that exact CGI rendering. On all fours, its backside probably about four to four and a half feet in height. The head higher, easily reaching five feet. Again, there was no way that this was a bear or other regular beast we're familiar with as humans. There was nothing familiar about it. To anyone who might say, maybe it was just a really large dog that was sick and hunched. No, it was bigger than the largest dog breeds I've ever seen. It had to be over four feet in height, at the back not the head, while hunched over. Definitely not a regular dog. Impossible to be a bear as none of this skinny. The humanoid aspect of it could not be denied. You could tell that if it wanted to, 
They could have easily stood up on two legs. What's more insane is that I could feel its energy. The energy was dark, oppressive, and really just a sense of danger swept over me. It had a very otherworldly energy about it. To continue, I slowly continued driving and quickly stared over to the left side of the road as I was passing to see where it had gone. I was able to see its silhouette by a bush, looking back at me watching me pass. I didn't want to stop. I was scared. I went on with my mission to release the mouse. But I can tell you this. When I got home, I ran into my garage and shut that garage door as quickly as possible. I was panicked. Truly terrified. When you know what you saw, you know what you saw, they always say. I also know my mind didn't just fill in the blanks or hallucinate this. Last night I looked up stories of dogmen, only to find people's descriptions and drawings were fairly identical to what I had witnessed. What are the odds of that? Now I'm convinced it's real. I never thought in my wildest dreams that I'd ever see anything like this. Does anyone know how common Oregon sightings are? And has anyone ever heard of an Oregon coast sighting? I'm also curious if anyone else has ever heard of literally getting sick to your stomach or not feeling well just before the encounter. Thanks. Edit to add. I do have house security cameras, but they're all out of batteries. I'm going to get them set back up today and make sure to record at night. From here, moving forward. When I was around six or seven years old, my family and I were driving in southwestern Ontario, Canada, pretty late at night. While we were driving, I was staring out the window, watching the fields of corn and beans pass by. To my surprise, out of seemingly nowhere, this creature runs up out of one of the cornfields. It was large, bipedal, dark in color and looked like a canine, but had a thick body which reminded me of a bear. It ran with the vehicle for maybe a few seconds, then dashed back in the field. I was more surprised that this thing could run at the same speed as our vehicle, more than I was surprised to actually see the thing itself. We were driving down a country road, which, as an adult, I now know means we were easily clocking 90 kilometers per hour, or 55 miles per hour. I didn't tell anyone until we got home. When I finally did tell my mom, she just said the standard stuff, like, you were dreaming. It was your imagination. I know I wasn't sleeping. But I will say I've doubted my own experience my entire life. However, at 25 years old and still remembering it so vividly, I now firmly believe it was a real experience that I had. I really just wanted to get this off my chest. Maybe share a true story that someone else also has an experience with. I don't know. I've seen ghosts and had weird things happen to me before, but for some reason, this one particular event always stuck with me. Either way, before this post gets too long... I'm signing off. Three or four nights ago, I was so sick that I couldn't sleep. So I went out to sit on my balcony, which overlooks many large trees. These trees have thick, clearly visible branches not obscured by anything. There are also lights around my condo which illuminate things, and I live near a busy city. Lots of light pollution. So although it was midnight, I could see silhouettes very well. I'm peering over the balcony, and on this branch close to maybe 15 meters away from me, there's this huge dark shape. I'm talking bigger and wider than a person. It looks like two tightly folded wings, and I could see it overlapping the branch. As in, it wasn't behind the branch on the ground. This weirded me out because I'm very familiar with the view at night, and that shape has never been there. I stared at it for maybe ten minutes, moving around on the balcony to try and figure out what it was, but no luck. So I made a note of it in my mind, making absolutely sure it's vivid in my memory, and go back to bed. Tonight, I was having trouble sleeping, so I went up to the balcony, again at midnight. The shape is gone. I'm kind of freaking out, because my family and I have no history of hallucinations. 
I quadruple checked that what I was seeing was real that first night. And the thing was again huge, like a large creature with folded wings. I live in Southeast Asia, and the biggest bird here is an average sized eagle. Hell, the biggest animals aren't even half the height of a person. What did I see? Note, there are also three reports of similar sightings, but those are dated from 2015 and might not mean anything. Any help identifying what it could have been or just a logical explanation is highly appreciated. I'm really freaked out. I'm happy to clarify in the comments if anyone is lost. My father and uncle have a story of living as outsiders, non-native Caucasians, young people on the reservation, their tale of experiencing a skinwalker. My grandma taught school on the reservation, and they lived well off compared to the natives living there. From what I know, there's a lot of lore surrounding the Navajo Nation, non-natives, primarily older generations, keeping their experiences and stories left unspoken, especially to those not from the culture. Forgive me if I'm mistaken in any of this. The culture, ideology, practices, or any other part. I'm just trying to tell the story my family has only spoken to me in whispers about. My grandmother, father, and uncle lived there for a few years. And their experience was much different than the Navajo people who have lived there for generations upon generations. I just want to tell their story and get insight as to anyone else who has lived in that community and any other stories some people might be willing to share. My father and uncle are about two years in age apart. They lived in the Navajo Mountain in the 1980s. My dad was 10 to 12, and my uncle younger. As it goes, they were always outside riding bikes with their friends, natives of the reservation. My grandma was recovering from an abusive relationship with their father and wasn't too concerned with their whereabouts, being it was a small community. There wasn't much trouble around, nor would they know what real trouble was at that age. Trouble wasn't the issue to young white boys on a reservation then. Pure terror was. It was a typical night without any parental supervision. The night was colder than usual, and the night sky was blacker than you can imagine. In such a desolate place, the stars in the sky would light the night. This night was as if the earth had moved to a different dimension, an abyss. The boys raced each other, as they did every night, until they were compelled to force their brakes in unison. They simultaneously looked up. Each boy's face melted from carefree, innocent, and adolescent to unadulterated horror. The boys stood motionless, grasping their bikes with every nerve, muscle, and strength in their body on the dirt road. To the right of them was a mesa, one they rode by every day the mesa that paralleled from my family's home, the mesa that they could see through my father and uncle's bedroom every night. This mesa would become fear and nightmares to them from this night onward. At the top of the mesa was a roaring fire, taller than any bonfire that someone could assemble, bigger than a group of people could assemble. It raged and was unbelievable. It was almost as tall as the mesa itself. More unbelievable was the pitch black figure seen cavorting around the bonfire. The native boys with my father and uncle informed them that this was not a typical Navajo dance or ritual. Pits began to form in their stomachs. Friends of my father and uncle turned back around without a word and bolted back to their homes. My father and uncle threw their bikes on the ground and ran across the unpaved road to their home. The two came back in panic, relaying what they'd seen to my grandmother. But she was unconcerned. A legend of the natives, she told them, and shooed them away. They lay awake all night in their shared room, not saying a single word to one another. They forced their curtains as close as possible, too scared to look out the window and see what they shouldn't have to begin with. Neither could shake the images burnt into their memory. But the sun managed to rise and peeked through into their room. A sense of release washed over them as the darkness had faded. 
The boys left their beds and traveled to the kitchen to try a second time to tell my grandmother what they saw that night. They tried to get a handle on what they saw, but it was as if they couldn't explain it. Again, my grandmother brushed them off. With a coffee and newspaper more important than their story, she told them to climb the mesa and investigate. The boys wrangled the friends who shared the experience with the night prior as they passed on their bikes. The friends stayed on the dirt road, looking up at the mesa as my father and uncle climbed up to see any evidence of the hell-burning fire that they witnessed together. The mesa wasn't much taller than an average one-story house, so the brothers took less than two minutes to climb to the top where the nightmare took place. When they got to the top, they were hysterical and also relieved. There was no indication a bonfire of that enormity, or even a fire at all had taken place on the mesa. They had clearly seen it the night before. They climbed down and told the message to the friends who had also been a part of the shocking scene. Their native friends looked at them in shock, but neither said a word to them. They immediately turned their bikes around and proceeded home. It was never talked about again, despite my father and brother asking about it. My grandmother and everyone else in that community refused to talk about it again. My father is a skeptic. He does not believe in anything paranormal. Aliens ghosts, mermaids, you name it. But whenever I ask about the skinwalker he saw, he turns pale and white. He gets quiet, jumpy and curt. I had to plead to get the full story out of him, and I could see goosebumps and every hair standing up on his arms when he shared his experience. My grandma took me to Navajo Mountain in 2019 to show me her history and to see how Navajo natives still live on this reservation today. According to her, not much has changed since living there in the 80s. I hiked and explored what I could of the reservation, as to not invade or violate any of the Navajo reservation and its beauty. However, I did feel a change in mood when I visited. My existence felt heavy, as if I wasn't supposed to be there, or if I was invading on territory that wasn't meant for me. Not caused by any of the community there, but just by my presence being on the land. I will never forget my experience visiting and all that I learned about reservation life. I climbed the mesa where the skinwalker that my dad and uncle saw had its ritual. I felt pretty normal until I got to the top and stood in the middle. I felt darkness creep into me as I stood there. I've never been the same since. Hello. I'd like to share something that happened to me when I was nine years old, and that I remember really well, even now that I'm 35. I swear, I'm not lying or seeking for attention, but it bothers me that I haven't been able to find a proper explanation until now, so I'm asking for your help. I was on holidays with my family at Gabice, a fairly known place in the Adriatic coast in Italy. I'm mentioning it because there were several weird legends surrounding this region, like the Valbruna Towns, which is known as the Italian Atlantis, since it was apparently submerged by the sea for unknown reasons during Roman times, and fishers and locals claim to have found remnants of columns, temples, and other proof of it, as well as an ancient temple dedicated to Zeus, which was located on the St. Baralto Mountain, which is located just nearby or miraculous sightings of the Virgin Mary. Also, it's quite an eerie place, because mountains, seas, and towns are all merged together. I was taking a stroll with my father. There were many people surrounding us because it was June and the streets near the seaside were crowded, when I suddenly saw something really weird laying on the pavement. It was an animal's, or reptile's apparently, leg, which had been cut off but instead of dripping blood, it oozed a clear, slimy fluid. It was dark green, almost black in color, covered in scales, a little lighter underneath with three slender digits, the middle one longer than the others, and every digit sported a curved claw, kind of like a hen's foot. Of course, I got really spooked off, and I instantly tried grabbing my father's attention about my discovery, but he looked really annoyed at me, claiming that there was nothing on the pavement. 
I'm absolutely sure that he wasn't lying. But at the same time, I'm also really sure about what I saw. Nobody else seemed to notice that horrible paw, so I just walked away. When I got back a couple hours later and checked the same spot, there was nothing. As I grew older, I did some research, and I found some similarities with a tatzel worm's leg. But since the creature is legendary and apparently doesn't really exist, I was more oriented, believing that it could have been an abnormally big, slow worm or lizard's leg. Except, those usually have four digits instead of three, and they don't usually sport claws of any sort. I also researched about sea cryptids, but no sea worms or other creatures have been sighted in the Adriatic Sea. If that was a cryptid's leg, though, other people should have seen it. Another possible explanation is the Green Man, which is a legend about a reptile-human hybrid which has been sighted in various places near River Po and Emilia Romagna, but it looks like he's really elusive and refuses contact with humans. I don't know what to believe anymore. What really bothers me is that nobody apparently could see what I saw on that day. Do you believe that it might have belonged to some ghostly being or to a fae? Could someone please help me understand? And who or what could cut it off like that? And for what reason? These unanswered questions are really obsessing me lately. I grew up in Okinawa, Japan because I was a military brat. My father and his friends, along with my younger brother and a few of our father's friends' sons, would go fishing deep in the woods, at a secluded fishing hole that only locals would typically know of. So one day, it was almost time to go, and my father instructed me, my younger brother, and the other guy's two sons to start toting the extra fishing gear back to the car, which was probably a little less than half a mile away. As we were passing underneath a bridge, we heard a loud crash from above in some nearby trees. All four of us looked up to see a creature that I can only describe as resembling a massive mongoose-slash-fox-like looking beast, covered in dark brown hair and roughly the size of a young lion. It had two tails that were bushy like a fox. It looked at all of us briefly, then jumped away in leaps and bounds that were not possible by any creature we know of on Earth. It was at that point that I realized that a lot of the Japanese manga slash anime and Pokemon folklore that they put on TV isn't completely fiction based. They're really telling us about cryptids that they have known existed since the beginning of recorded history. I know a lot of people get on these sites and post make believe stories for likes, but I have never been as terrified and as puzzled as I was by this event. Mind you, four people saw it. It was broad daylight and none of us were old enough to be influenced by any sorts of drugs. I've only spoken to a few close friends about this experience, and my parents don't quite believe me. When I was about 12 years old, me and my two younger brothers and my two younger cousins were playing outside at night. Our cousins came over to see us and all of the adults were inside the home. We lived in a smaller trailer park in Texas at the time, and it was built either on top of or near indigenous land. We played outside a lot at the time, and there was a street light that shone over the part of the road that we were playing on, so it didn't feel so creepy. I looked down the road where a white house sat, and next to it was a garage, and next to that was the forest. There was a lot of forest in the area, and I saw something coming out of the forest. I thought it was a wolf for a brief moment. Then I felt my heart sink when I saw its distorted looking long thin limbs, and the uncanny way that it moved brought tears to my eyes. It had a long head and a small mouth, like a horse tan in collar and was extremely thin and had no tail. I grabbed my cousins and told them to look where I was pointing 
and asked if they could see it too, or if I was crazy. They had a terrified look on their faces and said, Yes. Then, I looked over where I saw the creature, and it got up and started walking on its two hind legs, and moved in such a freaky way. It began to climb the garage with ease. This thing had to have been around 8 to 10 feet tall while standing on its back legs. I then ordered everyone to run inside. I told the adults what we saw and they didn't believe us for whatever reason. I assumed they thought it was our imaginations. Anyway, I haven't seen those cousins since the encounter due to family issues. I've searched the internet many times trying to find a sighting report or image that resembles this creature, to which I have had no luck finding. So now, I'm turning to Reddit. Let me know, please, if you know anything about what we saw that night, or if you have seen something like it. My story is a little boring, but it happened to me on Wednesday, so here you go. I was rock climbing with two other guys in Colorado and was belaying one of them when the two friends on the ground heard something weird. The commands we used to communicate that we're safe at the top of the route are name of guy on the ground, off belay, which prompts the belayer to unclip the rope from his belay device so the climber can pull slack out of the rope. The response to that command is name of guy at the top of the route, belay off. The climber was approximately 40 meters up on a roughly 50 meter route. I didn't know this at the time. The rope stopped moving, which isn't uncommon when someone is having a hard time with a move, or is setting up an anchor, which is what I thought was going on. Then we heard it. A voice that sounded way closer to the ground, like close enough we could have had a shouting conversation, and way further left off the route of where the climber should have been. It said, Tommy Sticks off belay. I looked at the other guy in our climbing party who was just as confused as I was. He said to me, what was that? And we discussed where the climber should be at this time and that we shouldn't be able to hear him that well. The rope still wasn't moving, but I decided to keep him on belay. I figured it would be best to keep him safe and just feed slack through my belay device in the event that it wasn't him. Turns out it wasn't. A few moments later, the rope started moving again, later followed by a faint syllable counted, Tommy Sticks, off belay, that sounded way more like it should have. We didn't really think anything of it, but we have been traveling down the wall and hit a few routes without seeing anyone. We also had a friend just a few months ago that burned in on a route and took someone off belay when he wasn't safe. I remember seeing a video of a hiker, or rancher or something, walking down the road when he hears a voice of a woman calling him off the road. The guy stops to try to figure out what's going on, then just gets out of there because of how weird it was. Is there a specific cryptid that mimics the voice of a person? This story takes place in San Antonio, Texas. I was an amateur runner at the time, about 18 to 19 years old. My brother, my older cousin, but was basically my bro, and I would train during the summer. One promise slash agreement we had was he'd challenge me to a run, and I had to accept. The latest on this day was at 10.30 to 11 p.m. We started the run, and of course, it was pitch black. It was super sketch too, because we couldn't see far ahead of ourselves. My cousin and I knew this running trail like the back of our hands. It's called O.P. Schnabel Park. We had spent years running throughout this park, even establishing our own trails. The reason I say this will come up later. So, we're running through the first, second, and third pavilion on the trail, and onto the soccer field adjacent to the trail. The field is attached to the running trail. We were headed to the soccer field to do sprint work before heading back. Anyway, as we exit the trailhead, we see a humongous thing in front of us. 
it had to be about 250 to 280 pounds wide. It had antlers and was maybe about six foot six or so. I'm six foot even. And it was sitting out in the open underneath a park lamp near a bench. Imagine seeing a creature underneath an amber lamp in an empty field just waiting for you. It saw us, pivoted, and stood up and started snorting. My brother hits my chest and just starts cursing and cursing and physically turns me around and then shouts, run. It was the most terrifying feeling I've ever had. My cousin was much faster than me at running, so looking back, it was funny how he smoked me in terms of speed. We ran to the first pavilion at O.P. Schnabel. It was well lit and opened up to the largest trailhead, so the decision began. Well, do we run back? And we agreed to do so. Mind you, it's still pitch black and about seven miles back home. I swear that this was the most intense run I've ever done in my life. We talked about what we saw independently the next morning. We both saw the antlers, it standing up, and the figure. It had a body of a bear. I looked up cryptids native to South Texas to try and ID the thing, too. I've talked to numerous people to try and explain this. It looked very similar to the goat man pictures in the size of the thing and the big horns. However, it looked more like a deer with a huge, wide torso body. I'd like to know if anyone in South Texas has experience with this or knows more about what we encountered. It's something that my brother and I have spent almost a decade trying to explain for ourselves, and we still haven't come up with any sort of logical conclusion. Last night I had some friends over. We were chilling and having fun. Just us. No one home and couldn't reach anyone if we needed to as my sister was out of town and my parents were out for the night with no signal. My friends and I went to get ice cream from the shed out back. A few steps out, we all hear a loud yelling coming from the field across. A male voice. We live in the country, so no neighbors. There was sheep, but this was someone yelling. There's a difference. This instantly made us all run inside. We go to sit in the living room, and that was when we all heard a light knocking from the window in the room next to us. This definitely wasn't our imagination, as we wouldn't all be able to hear it. We also tested it by staying still in silence, and yet again we heard it. I was wondering, does anyone else have any idea of what this could possibly be? This story happened in 2007 and gets told every time my family gets together. My Nana owns a farm and she's always had a herd of cows and a guard donkey. In one of her cattle fields, there used to be a large circle of mushrooms that my Nana said was a fairy circle. Now my Nana is Irish and Irish people don't mess with fairies and she refused to even mow over the circle. When she married my step granddad, he didn't believe in fairies or the paranormal and he wanted to remove the circle from the field, but my Nana told him not to. He thought that she was just being silly, and they would argue about it all the time. Long story short, he went behind her back and had the fairy circle removed while she was away. When she found out what he did, she refused to talk to him for days, and was very angry and got upset. Two weeks after the circle was removed, all of her pregnant cows aborted their calves, my Nana was devastated since she is very experienced and careful with looking after her cows, and she had never lost all of her calves before, and it hasn't happened since. She's lost one or two, but never all of them. There was also a strange, scary experience that involved me that my Nana believed was also connected. My mom and one-year-old me stayed with my Nana for a few days to cheer her up, since she was still upset about the calves. Somehow, I ended up catching chicken pox, which is supposed to be rare in babies under one. Luckily, I wasn't too sick, but it still scared everyone. I know that my Nana still leaves small offerings in the cattle field like small cakes and barley water, even though my step-granddad still thinks it's silly. I've stayed at her farm a lot, 
And the field definitely has a different feel to it than I've ever felt anywhere else. Especially at night. And I would never stay outside after dark. I know it was probably just two random coincidences. But it's definitely become a legend. In my family. Me and a friend went to the woods to a barbecue over a fire, as we do now and then all year round. I live in Stockholm, and the woods we go to lie next to a lot of apartments. I've always been very into the Sasquatch and Bigfoot subject, and I know it's real. We have them here in Sweden as well. What people refer to as trolls here is the same as Bigfoot or Sasquatch. Same being, different names. However... Me and my friend went into the woods to a specific place we always go to when we make our fire, barbecue, and drink beer. After a while, when the fire was started, I grabbed a big stick, went to a tree, and knocked it hard three times. Ten minutes pass, and further into the woods, I see this orb just appear, and it hovers about three meters off the ground. I stare at it and think to myself, that's not a person with a flashlight or anything like that at all. The orb just hovered at the same spot and then disappeared, and I thought to myself, weird stuff is about to go down. Time passes, and darkness has fallen over the woods. Me and my friend sit in front of the fire where we hear a weird, weird noise, and my friend says, Did you hear that? I looked over the fire into the darkness, and see two dark yellow eyes, glowing in the darkness, staring at us. I said, do you see those glowing eyes staring at us? Yes, he answered. That's not a human, not an animal, nothing of that nature, I said, and he agreed. We stared at it for a solid 30 seconds, when it suddenly moves away, almost floating, leaving traces from the glowing eyes. I was creeped out. One week later, we go to the same spot and it's dark. The fire is lit when we suddenly start to hear trees break from the woods. Thick tree breaks. It starts from the left and moves to the right and circles around us. The tree breaks keep moving around us and they get closer. It gets quiet for a couple of minutes. All of a sudden, 15 meters to the right of us, a big tree break echoes through the woods. And I go, holy cow. And it gets quiet. Behind me and my friend stood this five meter long tree, and the fire was on a rock maybe one meter above the ground. Suddenly, something appears behind us and smashes the tree with the big log. This thing broke in half minutes before. It hit the tree so hard that it hit the ground and swung back up again. Me and my friend jumped back like two meters. This thing hit the upper part of the tree. My friend turns on the flashlight and looks around. We see nothing and it's quiet. The thing is that when me and my friend walked around the woods, we were loud, breaking twigs and tons of other sounds under our feet. But this thing moves fast, silently around us, and that's the scary part. I was so scared, so I just left the woods. I like the woods, but I get nervous and scared when I wander too far into the woods alone. One other time when I was walking on a track, Two stones come flying from above and land in front of me. I look up into the trees and see this transparent shaped thing in the trees, and then it just disappears. Have any of you had any scary encounters in the woods? I've never told anyone this, or talked about it to anyone, besides the people that were with me that night, and my best friend that claims to have seen him at a different date, that I didn't know about until I described my experience to him. I lived in a small town in Louisiana with my cousin and his wife. There's not much to do in Morehouse Parish besides drive back roads like we've done thousands of times before. Then, one night in 2015, we were leaving a church that we used to clean. It was around 2 a.m. or so. 
We were in my cousin's 1990 GMC Sierra single cab 4x4. So we decided to ride back roads. So we're cruising. Me and him are talking and listening to Nirvana. Probably we played music together. But anyway, his wife was asleep in the middle seat when we turned on a paved road five miles or so outside of town and come around a curve. And then there was something that we have never seen before. I'm an avid hunter been in the woods all hours of the night and day, was in the army, but I had never been more freaked out by something than what we witnessed. There was something dead in the road, and something eating it. When the headlights hit it, it looked up, and was about two and a half to three feet tall, like it was kneeling over whatever it was eating, had red eyes, and it stood up so fast, it seemed like a millisecond, it was seven or eight feet tall was pitch black its skin looked like a bat's skin but way darker and in one fell swoop it leapt and its wings opened and flew into the woods on the side of the road it had to be moving over 50 miles per hour this was the wildest experience of my life and i've always been cynical when it comes to paranormal stuff but i know what i saw that night and so does my cousin it was the mothman Thank you so much for listening to all of the stories in this video. I hope you enjoyed them. I also hope that you enjoy the extra rain that is at the end. Good night, everybody. And I'll read to you in the next video.